Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. It's been a wild week, wild week of basketball. Um, I put together like the little outline for what we're going to run through today and then had just kind of sat there and thought like, wow, we just saw all this happen in five, six days. Um, as always, you know, I, I'm Billy. I got my boy Dame with me. Um, Yo. We got a lot, a lot to talk about. It's probably going to be the longest episode yet. Bro, a whole bunch to talk about, bro. Make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe. Listen, buckle up, bro. We got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about today. Let's go. Yeah. So we ain't even, we're not even going to, you know, beat around the bush. We're going to get right to it. And I think probably the, the biggest thing to talk about, right, the Milwaukee Heat are the sixth, eighth seed ever, or maybe the fourth, fourth or sixth, one of the two, eight seed ever to knock out a one seed in the first round and the first team since the play-in tournament started to win a playoff series. And they did it in five wow. games. That's so cr- – five games. But Milwaukee only beat them once. I understand Giannis was out, but, bro, five? That's this crazy. This Heat team was dead in the water. Like, when you go back and think about it, mm-hmm. they were down to the Bulls with only a couple minutes left in that last Right. They, they almost didn't get here. They weren't, even, they weren't even supposed to be here. Once they lost to the Hawks, it was like, bro, they weren't. They were supposed to be done for. They weren't supposed to be here. And they looked bad in that game. They looked, right. They didn't look good in the Bulls game either. Mm-hmm. And then, playoff Jimmy. <laughs> you play off Jimmy, bro. Jim Michael Jordan, whatever you want to call him. <laughs> I genuinely, watching this run that he just went on, Made me reevaluate everything I feel like I've ever thought about Michael Jordan ever. <laughs> because what are you supposed to do? Like, what is anyone on Milwaukee supposed to do? I know people have gone with the like, you know, Giannis should have guarded <clears throat> more, and like we'll get in more to about, you know, kind of what the Bucks did wrong in this series. Right. A lot of it is honestly, I think, on Coach Bud as a whole and how he's been his whole time in Milwaukee, but. Like at the end of the day, right, you ask any NBA player who the best defender is, a lot of them are going to say Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday was guarding mm-hmm. him for the vast majority of the series. And a lot of times the help defenders are Giannis, Brooke. Like, it's not slouches that he's scoring on. He's literally taking it at y'all best defensive players. Nothing y'all can do about it. Bro, it's – what Jimmy has been doing, it makes no sense, bro. It's – insane and like you said the fact that he's doing it against drew holiday Giannis, and brooke lopez these are like all dpoy like caliber right. defenders that he's doing it against and he's making them look stupid now like to be fair i would say that coach bud doesn't help because he doesn't send no double teams he doesn't make any adjustments mm-hmm. like he just bro it's so easy for for someone like jimmy butler to go off of them and that's kind of the reason why i picked boston to beat them if they was to make it to the Eastern Conference Finals is because, like, the wings, like, all right, don't get me wrong, Drew Holiday is a great defender, but he's also, what, 6'3", 6'4"? Yeah, like, shorter, got, yeah. Exactly. When you have, like, a Jimmy Butler who's a who's a bigger wing, a Jason Tatum, a Jalen Brown, he's just too small to defend those guys. And, like, every game this season, the Celtics was, like, those two players were going off every time they played the Bucks. So that was one of the reasons why I feel like um, Boston would have beat them, and obviously I guess I was right. But um, that's that goes a little bit between Coach Bud and the way the roster is constructed because, yes, Drew Holiday is a great perimeter defender, but you need someone else who's a little bit taller, I feel like, be, to be able to stop those great wings um, yeah. like Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Jimmy Butler. So a lot of it is on Coach Bud, but a lot of it also is the way the roster is constructed. And it, it's just a little bit tough. Like, yeah, I guess I would like to see Giannis guard him a little bit more, but it's like that's not really his strong suit, though. Right, like, and it never really defense. has been. Exactly. Like, it's not really his strong suit. Like, I mean, honestly, when you're down, when you're down 3-1, I guess you might as well try something if it hasn't been working, but that's not really his strong suit. So, it, it literally exactly what you just said, right? Drew Holiday, being a great defender that he is, he's given up a little bit of size there, right? Mm-hmm. Giannis's strength has not ever been guarding perimeter, like perimeter on the defender or grind, mm-hmm. guarding primarily on the perimeter. Uh, you know, even when he won the UI, a lot of that came from his ability to rotate as a help defender. So you say all that, right? You need a lengthy wing defender. 
did they not just trade for for Jay Crowder? Five second round. That picks. is true. That is five true. second that. round <laughs> picks in Jordan Nora. And he can't see the floor in an elimination game where this man has been giving y'all buckets. Nothing y'all are doing is working. In the elimination game, Jay Crowder played. He didn't even log a full minute. Literally said zero wow. minutes. Wow, that's bad, bro. Well, then what is what is the whole point of the trade? I think he just tweeted today, like some you know how he was doing with the whole sunset. Yeah. and weird cryptic tweet says something about like. I don't understand my role on this team, but like I would feel the same way. I'm watching yeah, no, this guy role. like ruin y'all season, and we're just gonna keep letting Brook Lopez play drop coverage. We're just gonna keep that's like that's the problem. It's not the fact that like stuff didn't work, it's the fact that you're not even trying different things. Like you need to switch it up, at least try to send double teams. Sub in Jay Crowder, try to put Giannis. Like, I at least need to see you trying. Now, if he's just, if you're sending everything at him and he's just killing y'all, hats off, bro. He's right. Jimmy's just that guy. But, like, bro, you're not even trying to make any type of adjustments, bro. Yeah. Like, I don't know, man. Coach, but uh, I think he's done in Milwaukee. Yeah, that's been done. his, that's been a lot of what people have criticized him about in the <clears> past, <throat> that he goes into a game plan. With his game plan, and, and that's it, win, lose, or draw, right? He's not mm. switching anything up game to game. Whether they're up, down, doesn't matter. Whatever they're running is what they're running. And, again, going into this series is fine. Like, we're going to go under screens on Jimmy. We're going to play drop coverage. Like, all of these things can make sense. <clears throat> because the Heat are one of the worst shooting teams. I think they finished 27th, right? Like, third worst. Yeah, yeah. Three-point shooting. Do you know that they are the, the – up to this point in the playoffs, the best three-point shooting team. Bro, they got hot out of nowhere, bro. But it's not even close, bro. They are shooting 45% from three. But that is – bro, that's insane. The next closest like, team is the Suns at 40.7. That is insane. Like, I, I guess – I think that's part of the reason maybe why I'm trying to, like – play devil's advocate i guess that's part of the reason why maybe bo was like we're not going to switch anything up because it's like when a team's shooting that bad for most of the season you might think like okay they might come down to earth a little bit but right uh, i don't but, know man no at some point bro it's like okay you drop the first game you get the second one mm -hmm. back you drop the third game you drop the fourth game it's an elimination game it's like you just had this man drop 56 on you and you're just gonna let him do it all over again like bro, you got to no do sense. something. Um, it makes no sense, bro. Like, yeah. and, the, and, it, and honestly, it's crazy because it's not even just the adjustments. Like, Coach Bud had a – he's going to get fired. Like, he had a horrible agree, yeah. coaching series in general. Even the fact that they were up double digits in both of those last two games that they lost, they were up double digits with what? how many – like, what, three minutes, four minutes left, something like that. And the, and the just, one where he dropped 56, they were up by 10 with, like, five or six minutes left. Bro, they're on a run. Call a timeout. Like, bro, call a timeout. What are you doing? We could spend bro. a whole episode on this. It's like, <laughs> bro, oh my God, bro, call a timeout. And then when um when they had 0.5 seconds left after Jimmy made that that game tying shot, you didn't call a timeout then. When Giannis is out of control, dribbling the ball up the court, throws it to Middleton, he throws it to Grayson Allen. Call a timeout, bro. What are you doing? Yeah. Like, oh, it's, he just – that was bad. That was bad to watch. That was horrible to watch. Yeah, it was one of the most mismanaged collapses I've seen from a team in a long time. Again. And I, that is gonna, it's going to continue to be talked about, but this has to be one of the biggest upsets we've ever seen in playoff history, if not the biggest, right? Like, it's up there with, mm -hmm. like – um, you know, like the We Believe Warriors taking out the one seed of Mavericks. Um, you know, so like in terms of Vegas odds, it's probably one of the biggest upsets there too. Like, and as much credit has to go to obviously Jimmy Butler first and foremost, like he absolutely carried them in mm -hmm. all these games. But like we said, the three point shooting out of nowhere is elite. Um, you know, and that a lot of that is due to, you know, Max Struess having nights, Duncan Robinson, you know, getting his shot after they gave Finally him, getting minutes. Right. And like you said, finally getting minutes. And he's a, 
he had a couple of nice games. He was shooting the ball at a really good clip. Um, mm-hmm. Gabe Vincent in that uh, that uh, game five, huge, huge shots there, especially down the stretch. A lot of people aren't even going to remember um, the, the deep three that he hit to make it a one-point right. game. Right, um, right. You know, he had some big moments. Caleb Martin is hitting threes in people's faces and <laughs> hitting them with this. Like, they, everybody on that team, you know, the others, like as Shaq would say, the others definitely stepped up in this series. But, um, I, look, we could do a whole deep dive analysis on all the things that the Bucks did wrong in just game five alone. But I think none of them are worse than, A, obviously, right, like you're up in the game have you know he have the ball with a chance to tie and they take brooke lopez out right that's another one like we didn't even mention it like that's how many bad decisions and things that coach bud did we didn't even i for, i completely forgot about the fact that they took bro brooke lopez out in that situation that's just bro I, what is even what is your reasoning for that a two-point game so, like, the likelihood of them having to attack the basket is significantly higher. Very high. And mm-hmm. you take out a defensive player <laughs> of the year candidate. Oh, my gosh. It's just bad coaching. It's just terrible coaching. That's terrible. Whatever. Jimmy makes it. And I don't know if you saw in the two-minute report, they said he got fouled. So, he honestly should have had an and one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I seen it, yeah. Because yeah. cause there were people trying to say that he pushed off, and then pe- people were saying, like, oh, no, actually, he technically got fouled on that play, but they weren't going to call in that situation. So, Bucks actually got lucky right there. Right. But he makes a shot, right, ties the game. You don't call a timeout, right? So, you're just mm-hmm. accepting that you're going to go to overtime at that point. Then, in, the, in overtime, like you said, Heat are going on runs. I don't know. Boonhozer's sitting on two timeouts. You have the ball with a chance to tie. Giannis is coming down full head of steam. I get it right. Like you, that's what you want. You don't call a timeout mm-hmm. then. I can understand that. He falls on the ground. Okay. Gets to Middleton. Okay. He gets stuffed at the, the high post. Okay. We're not going to call a timeout. No, Grayson, Allen, call timeout. Grayson Allen is holding the ball with the buck season on the line. We're just going to watch him dribble it out. Bro. There, <laughs> he's he's holding them for next year, next game. You, yeah, he's good. He's got extra timeouts. <laughs> you know what the funny part about that is? If Grayson Allen actually understood how much time was left, he actually had a decent. If he didn't take the euro step and he took that little floater for a midi or something, he actually had a a pretty great shot. If you really look at it, <laughs> yeah. he just I don't know. He just had a meltdown. But I, like you said, he shouldn't even be in that situation. Like the ball shouldn't even be in his hands how? to have to do that. How the broadcasters are like screaming for the ball to get to Middleton. It finally gets to Middleton. It gets to Grayson. And it's like, how did we get here? Like, how as a coach can you just like you're a fan? Like you're just right. you're just a spectator, <laughs> right? Like you have the power to stop all this from happening. Um, and I was talking to somebody else about it, and they were like, you know, it's tough because like Giannis was downhill, and like they got the ball to Middleton in a you know in a decent spot, but he kind of got walled up. And I was like, that's when you need to call the timeout because at the exactly. end of the day, right, like whatever, how much time is left, what, three, four seconds at that point? I could inbound the ball to right where Chris Middleton had it at. We could get the possession reset right there. That's not a hard mm-hmm. place to get the ball in at. You know? Yeah, you could you could have drawn, you could have drew, called the timeout, drew up a play for Chris Middleton so he'll be in a better situation, not just – like, bro, they were just scrambling. You like, see what sideline my... out of bounds play Spo just drew up to send it to overtime. But Spo is a good coach. <laughs> coach Bud is not. I don't know. He's not a good coach. Uh, bro, it was just. It was just horrible. It was a horrible, horrible meltdown. It was. It was really, really bad. Yeah, but... I think. And watching it back, right, like a lot of the baskets that Jimmy Jimmy's making is, is tough, right? Like some of it is coverage based, like we said. Like you, you're leaving Brook Lopez in this drop. He's just knocking down shots like you're hoping he's not going to, but he's done it all series. So mm-hmm. that's a coaching issue. A lot of the times that Jimmy or Giannis is guarding him, it's like you got to tip your cap. Like he's just making a tough shot. It's good defense, better offense. Right. Um, can't be, you know, skipped over here. Giannis shooting horribly from the free throw line. Something we still haven't even talked about. Another part of the breakdown is off mm-hmm. of that jump ball. 
he gets it and almost throws it out of bounds because that's he's bad. afraid to go to the free throw line. Yeah, that's bad, he's especially from your to, best player. Right. He's that's trying bad. to get it to Chris Middleton because he doesn't want to get fouled. He's afraid he's going to miss it. But, like, what did he end up going? 10 for 10 23? For 23. Right. 10 for 23. 13 for missed free throws from your best player who it's like we know that that's been an issue with his we've seen him have bad free throw shooting nights we've seen him to close out the finals have a phenomenal free throw shooting night so mm-hmm. it happens and obviously you know he's not at 100 percent coming back from the injury but i mean you probably ask anybody myself included right like even without Giannis in this series you know fully healthy i still would have taken the bucks you know in mm-hmm. addition to the heat they don't have Tyler Hero. It's like Jimmy just said, you know, F all that. I don't care. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm going to do what I need to do. Just um, get on my back. Right. To win these games. And, and he did it. And it was one of the the greatest playoff performances in an individual game. Obviously, that 56-point game. One of the greatest series performances we've ever seen. Like, not even just from a, a heat franchise level, but, like, this is mm-hmm. – we just witnessed, like, a generational performance in the first yeah. round to send home – was that was my pick to win the finals. Like I said, in the, I think in the first episode we did, like, if I had to put money on it right now, put my money on Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. And they are at the crib in five games. Just insane. Honestly, this isn't a good look for – a lot of people, like a lot of Giannis fans, which, fair or not, there's going to be a lot of people that say, oh, how is Giannis the best player in the world? How, if if Joel B got bounced in the first round, if Nicole Jokic, Katie got bounced in the first round, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to jump the gun and say, oh, Giannis isn't this, Giannis isn't that, which, I mean, the way I see it, I don't really change my opinion on players just based off of one, mm-hmm. one series. I can't even say bad. He had, what, 38 points in, like, 14 rebounds. So he didn't have a bad game. Yep. Yes, he missed a lot of free throws, but he didn't necessarily have like a choke job game. But I don't really change my opinion on players based off one game, one series. I give players room to, you know, make mistakes, you know, right. come back, this, that, and the third. But in saying that, I do feel like Giannis does have to improve. I feel like the free throws, leaving 13 points is just unacceptable. You can't, you cannot do that. I need you to hit at least. What game is different if you hit what six more, seven more? Like, I don't even need two, you to be, <laughs> two like, yeah, more. Yeah, like, like, I don't need you to be 80, 90 percent from the free throw line. I just need you to be you can't be not, sub 50. Exactly, you can't be horrible from the free throw line. And like, in late in the game, it's tough because the way Giannis plays, he can't really be that guy mm-hmm. who's a closer in the game. Because at the end of the day, Giannis is a big man, he plays on the perimeter, but Giannis right. is a big man, like, he yeah. can't be that closer that's why they have Chris Middleton that's why he was trying so hard to get the ball to Chris Middleton but I just feel like Giannis does have some room to improve but it's gonna it's gonna be a tough offseason for the Bucks. it's gonna be a real tough offseason because they're they're old too they're not like like what do you, where do you really go from here because your team mm-hmm. is old obviously it's flawed because when you have these great wing players who can just give you guys fits all day Jimmy Butler Jason Tatum Jalen Brown it's like you got to make some sort of roster moves. Chris Middleton, yeah. I think, is, what, 32 years old. Drew Holiday's getting up there. Brooke Lopez is getting up there. So uh, they got a lot of decisions. Got a lot of – I'm not going to say a lot of question marks, but they just – they got some decisions to make. Definitely. And, you know, to kind of, like, put a bow on how the Bucks played in this series, right, especially in this elimination game down the stretch, their offense just is so – it gets so stale in the half court sometimes, and we're looking mm-hmm. at – Giannis post-ups and he pulls that kind of like pull up midi a lot because guys will sag off of him but he never hits it at a really good clip um which you know kind of begs the question like why do we keep you know why do we keep shooting these shots when especially in a game where it's like that that close that tight um you know you need need these buckets here so yeah it's tough for sure like they have a lot of question marks obviously i think the biggest one being coach bud's job which a lot of insiders are already speculating is pretty much gone he'd already been he was on the hot seat before they won the championship you remember Mm -hmm. right there are people that were like i don't think this is the job for for boone holzer they win the chip that kind of alleviates some of the pressure but now again like a 
really one of the worst playoff collapses you could ever have. Um, and a lot of that, you know, injury aside is due to your decision making as a coach. Mm -hmm. you know who you're putting out on the floor how you're scheming it up like he was severely out coached by Spolstra you know Jimmy Butler other world you play aside like from just a full schematic pers perspective uh you know Spolstra just got the better of him um that's not the first time that this has happened to him as a coach for the Bucks. and so you know going into this offseason Chris Middleton has a player option Brooke Lopez is a free agent Javon Carter has a player option. Joe Ingles is a free agent. Jay Crowder is a free agent. So like a lot of their key players have, you know, player options or are, are fully free agents. And so, like you said, they're definitely going to have some decisions to be made. <clears throat> if I'm Jay Crowder, I mean, like even just generally knowing him, he probably doesn't want to come back. No, um, probably not. It feels like his time was wasted there, mm -hmm. um, which I wouldn't blame him again because – you know, like you said, they've been get they've had problems dealing with wings in the past, and they have a larger wing defender that for some reason can't see the floor in a series where you're getting cooked by Jimmy game after game. Um, so yeah, I it's gonna be tough for them. And like you said, everybody's getting up there in age. You know, it's life comes at you quick in the NBA, like two years removed from a championship. You know, a lot of people crown Giannis the best player in the league, myself included. Um, and now it kind of feels like, you know, there's a lot of you know, some work to be done, I guess, for this, this roster. Um, and it's going to be a lot of change, I think, going into next year. Obviously, you know, I, the coach first and foremost um, – with him gone and there's a lot of you know really good candidates up in the air and I wouldn't be shocked if Nick Nurse wasn't one of their you know one of the first people that they look at just because of what he was able to do in Toronto mm -hmm. and some of the length that they had there and some of the length that he could utilize in Milwaukee but um yeah they're gonna have to sort out <laughs> stuff with, with some of their, their top free agents obviously Brooke being the, the top guy there but like you said Chris is getting up there in age Brooke is up there in age Drew is getting up there in age like nobody's getting any younger they need to start planning for the future a little bit. Yeah. Not so. I'm not not future as in like without Giannis or anything. Future mm -hmm. as in just the next Milwaukee Bucks, not this Drew Milton Giannis, this Giannis and whoever's gonna be after that. So yeah, they yeah. definitely have they definitely got a lot of decisions to make. Yeah, and Giannis is up for the I think it'd probably be one of the first like brand new super max extensions on this new CBA. I mm -hmm. think it's September. Um, and I've already seen people start to speculate, you know, does he sign it then? You know, like, does he commit right now? Does he hold off a little bit? So it's definitely going to be a lot of, a lot of questions that are going to have to be answered for the Bucks um, this off season. I think first and foremost, starting with, with coaching, because I, I think them and Boonholzer has run its course. Um, 100%. Because that was some of the worst coaching I, I've ever seen. Um, yeah, if he he doesn't win that championship, he's probably gone years that ago. year. He, yeah, he has the same. He's always had these problems. Like it's not like he's a new guy or he's mm -hmm. like these problems are just a villain. He's always had these problems. Just that championship definitely gave him some breathing room. So now it's definitely it's about that time to move on. Yeah. So uh, with that, right with the the Bucks out and the Heat advancing, they're going to be taking on the Knicks, who. <laughs> dominated the Cavs uh, you know I can't really no other adjective really to describe it um right. and I think I, I think we both had the Cavs in six in this series mm -hmm. um and we kind of touched on it in the last last episode you know like they you know New York came out with a lot of physicality the Cavs kind of responded in game two then New York kind of came out in game three showed that physicality again you know, they're having issues stopping Jalen Brunson. R.J. Barrett got it going. You know, how does Cleveland respond? And they just didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, he really just did not. <laughs> um, never would I have ever thought that I would be saying these words, but Mitchell Robinson thoroughly and easily outplayed Jared Allen and Evan yes. Mobley. Yes, yes, yes. That was – that honestly – that was probably one of my biggest takeaways, the fact that he outplayed – he was the best big man in that series 
by, by far. By wasn't even close. By far, he was the best big man in that series. So shout yeah. out to Mr. Robinson. He he played great. I'm not gonna lie. Aaron like RJ Bear, like you said, he stepped up. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Jalen Brunson did his thing, but that was the real key takeaway for me. Mitchell Robinson played amazing. So yeah. He I think finished the series with two or three less offensive rebounds than Jared Allen and Evan Mobley had combined. And I got to pull up the stat again one more time because every time I, I looked at it, it, it kind of blew me from their their last game in game five. Um, I think he had like yeah, 18 rebounds that game. 18 rebounds, 11 offensive rebounds. The Cavs, as a team, they had nine people playing this game mm -hmm. had four offensive rebounds. Mitchell Robinson had 11. That's just – but he had more than double. That's Their crazy. entire team. Josh uh, Hart in this game had three offensive rebounds. He almost had as many as the Cavs himself. Mm -hmm. um, That's that Tibbs team, man. Just tough, going to defend, going to rebound, going to play hard. They just I, – like, I feel like I say this so, so much, they just wanted it way more than the Cavaliers did. And the Cavaliers, they, they had their flaws. I've seen a lot. Honestly, I'm not going to say full-on say exposed, but – they have a lot of flaws with that roster mm -hmm. as a whole. One yep. being, obviously, you can't start two seven-footers and then get severely out-rebounded <laughs> like that, severely outplayed like that. What is the whole point of having two big men? Yep. Like, what is the point of having two seven-footers on the floor? Mm -hmm. So that's one. And honestly, that third guy for them, like, besides uh, Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland, they need someone else to step up. They yeah. just they need a third guy. And I seen that I forgot where I seen this take, but they were saying when you really, really think about it, how many players on the Cavs are a great defensive player and a great offensive player? Not just like one or the other. Like, do they have a real like three and D player on that team? And I don't I feel like they don't really have that. Mm -hmm. That's why you got Jalen Brunson just doing whatever he wants to the Cavs, doing whatever he feels like doing, getting to his spots, controlling the game. Like they don't their roster as a whole just isn't constructed great for the playoffs, I feel like. It's, it's going to be a great regular season team. They're going to win a lot of games. But for the playoffs, it's just it's just tough. Yeah, people have been hopeful that, you know, Isaac Okoro's shot would come around. And it hasn't really materialized like they thought. You know, they had issues with spacing and shooting to some extent in this series. And, you know, Dean Wade wasn't getting a ton of run. They tried running Lamar Stevens for a bit, who's not a great shooter. Mm -hmm. They just, like you said, I think they're – a lot of people have criticized, right, they need that a wing, like a true wing to have, you know, to pair with, you know, DG and Donovan Mitchell, um, you know, to be that kind of third option. And Karras in some ways was able to kind of, you know, fill some gaps there. But like you said, there, there's no real 3 and D guy on this, this roster. Um, and yeah, you, you can't have two seven footers on the court being dominated by Mitchell Robinson, especially when one of them is was an all star last season and the other one is a you know defensive player of the year finalist. Mm -hmm. And he's the whole purpose of having him, right? Both of them are again thrown around on the block by Mitchell Robinson. So that was that was crazy to see. Uh, and I think another thing that really showed up in this series was the Knicks' depth as a whole. You know, they're able to go. Almost right. 10 guys deep if, if Quentin Grimes didn't really get hurt. Um, with, you know, really quality quality players here. Obi Toppin had some great, you know, moments, timely buckets a lot throughout the series. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a big hustle plays, lots of activity there. Um, Harnstein played some really key minutes for them um, down the stretch, especially in game five. Had a couple of big rebounds for them. Good interior presence. Um, we know what Emmanuel quickly can do. Sixth man of the year finalist. Um, and then, you know, if Quinn Grimes hadn't gotten hurt, um, that's another three and D type guy, who, you know, who can get hot on top of, you know, all the people that they already have starting. So their depth was, you know, better coming into the series. And I think it was a big reason why they were able to, you know, finish off this series in the fashion that they were able to, in addition to, and I have to give credit to Tibbs for this as, you know, kind of being known as a guy who'll play starters 48 minutes, mm -hmm. really spreading out the minutes in this series and having games where people are coming off the bench for 15, 20 minutes at a time. And you're not running Julius Randle and Jalen Brunson, you know, 45 minutes every game. Um, so I think that that helped. And, and 
and helping to close out this series a lot. But, um, yeah, like you said, there's a lot of room to grow for, for Evan Mobley, especially on the offensive end. And then, obviously, just physically, he's going to have to get bigger. He has to get stronger um, because – I imagine the long-term future is right. We kind of, they're going to phase Jared Allen out and they're going to have Evan Mobley kind of move to that, that five spot for them. So right. um, mm. he's going to have to get bigger because that yeah, just can't happen. Um, you know, obviously this is the first playoff series for him and Darius Garland and Darius Garland had his struggles um, in the series shooting, which is, you know, to be expected, right? It's his first time as a young guy. Um, I'm sure they'll bounce back from it. It'll be a good learning experience for them. But, um, yeah, even Donovan Mitchell had, you know, his struggles getting it going at, at times in the series. So, you know, hats off to the Knicks. They shocked a lot of people. I, like I said, I wouldn't have been surprised if the Knicks were able to win this series, but I definitely wouldn't have said it wouldn't have been in five games and not in the fashion that they were able to do it in, in all of these games. It really was not they particularly dominated. close. Yeah. Um, they definitely dominated. So, but, yeah, it's – honestly, it's interesting. Do you feel like we overrated the Cavs or did we underrate the Knicks? I've thought about that, and uh, I almost want to say it's an underrating of the Knicks, but I think it's probably a little bit of both, right? Like, I think mm-hmm. – I think we probably – didn't take into account as much not having that third guy on the Cavs would really impact them. I kind of expected, you know, obviously look at the end of the day, Donovan Mitchell was going to be Donovan Mitchell and he had those moments, but mm-hmm. you know, as a whole of a series, he definitely could have been better. Um, again, it would have helped if Darius Garland had been more consistent throughout the series, but um, neither here nor there. Um, and I certainly didn't expect Evan Mobley to get, you know, thrown around by Julius Randle and, and Mitchell Robinson the way that he did. Um, so that's probably a bit of an overrating on on that front. But, you know, for the Knicks as a whole, I kind of knew it and expected what I would get from Jalen Brunson, but definitely impressed with what I saw from R.J. Barrett, especially from, from okay. game three onward, um, games three, four, and five. You know, he came to play, and if he continues to play like this, um, we can also go ahead and get right into it. Like this next series against the Heat, it's going to be a dogfight. I think I, I put out a tweet. I said the NBA is going to need to have ambulances on standby. <laughs> nah, this is about though. to be gritty, physical mm-hmm. basketball we're going to see. Um, and both teams are, are going to be dangerous simply of the fact that, like, both of them probably feel like they're playing with house money at this point. I know a lot of right. the, the, the Heat are not supposed to be here at all. No, no. The Knicks were already the underdogs in this, you know, this first-round matchup with the Cavs. And so both of them feel like, you know, they have nothing to lose at this point. They're already further along than a lot of people expected them to be. So they're going to be throwing everything they got at each other. I'm excited to see, you know, the chess match between Tibbs and Spo and what they're going to continue to do. Obviously, first and foremost, probably the biggest storyline is like, what is New York going to do with Jimmy? Because he's got it going. And, you know, mm-hmm. we know what he can do in the playoffs and he's already put it on display here. So. There's a lot. There's a lot to watch out and look for in, in this series coming up. Yeah, it's it's gonna be a real, real fun one. Um, I'm I'm excited. I can't wait to watch this series. I can't wait. Like you said, I can't wait to see the chess match between how these guys are gonna defend Jimmy. I, well, honestly, I can tell you right now, I it's just, it's not going out on a limb. I feel like they're definitely gonna do a way better job than Milwaukee has mm-hmm. on Jimmy. Whether it's throwing double teams, whether it's showing him different bodies, showing him different looks, so. It's going to be real, real interesting. I honestly feel like – I guess I'm giving an early prediction. I feel like the Knicks are going to win this series. I kind of do, um, too. Yeah, I, I just feel like – I feel like, like I said, I feel like they're going to defend Jimmy. He's still going to go off. Like, it's playoff Jimmy. He's, like, the greatest player to ever touch the earth. Yeah. But <laughs> I, st- I just feel like they will do a way better job defensively on Jimmy than Milwaukee has. They have more bodies to, sh- to show at him. They're just a better – I'm not going to say a better defensive team, but the way they defend is a little bit different then Milwaukee so um yeah I got the Knicks one in this I think I want to say oh they're playing Knicks are playing good man they playing good I, I was gonna say six wow. they have home court advantage they do have home court there is no Tyler here wait I will say this we know we got to find out the help I'm not gonna give a prediction yet we got to find out the help on Julius Randle that's true that's true we got to fit because he did he injured he reactivated that ankle and mm-hmm. didn't return 
So I'm going to figure out the health on Julius Randle first. I'm not just going to go out there and give a prediction, but as of now, I feel like if Julius Randle could come back what, 80, 80 percent, something like that, I like the Knicks' chances in this series. Yeah, no, I – as soon as the Heat advanced, I'm thinking to myself, like, we are just one step away from a Knicks Eastern Conference Finals. Back at – the Eastern Conference Finals is going to be back at the Garden. That alone wow. is something that That's... I want to see. Um, but, you know, realistically looking at this from, you know, what I think could happen, I also just have, you know, like a gut feeling that the Knicks can pull it out. Like you said, I think that they can not saying that they're from a talent perspective better, but coaching wise, schematically, and obviously they still have the personnel to mm-hmm. do what they can to try to slow down Jimmy as much as possible, which again, should hinder the team as a whole without Tyler hero. So, um, I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot of doubles. Josh Hart's going to get turns at him. RJ Barrett's probably going to be the primary guy at him. They're going to be showing him a lot of, like you said, traps, double teams. I promise you they're not going to be going under screens like Drew Holiday was. They're not just going to be sitting in a drop. They're going to be throwing a lot of different stuff at him. So Mm -hmm. I'm optimistic that Tibbs will figure something out. This will still be a a tough, gritty series nonetheless. I'm probably going six or seven games. And honestly, I think seven because – there's just no way Jimmy's going out that easy, right? Like, no, he's going to win take... a couple games by himself. He's going right. to win one or two games just purely off of his talent alone. Yeah, so it's going to be a crazy one. I, this is one of the second-round matchups that no one was expecting, but I'm all of a sudden the most excited mm-hmm. to see. Right. <laughs> Moving over to the West, um, let's go to some of the series that are still moving on – or still going on um, – We'll start, we'll start with the Lakers series here. We'll get right to it. Um, let the, the Lakers fan have first go at it. Right now, the Lakers are up 3 2 on Memphis. Um, not the greatest of showing from the Lakers last game. LeBron definitely struggled mm-hmm. in the field. Uh, Desmond Bain had it going early and, and often that, that whole game. Um, and so, so tough one there. Memphis held it down at home court. They're heading back to LA for game six. Um, so, interested to see what your, your thoughts are right now for the Lakers. How you feeling? <laughs> Uh, so first of all, I'll I'll just start with the game four. I, it's crazy because I put in like notes as I was watching the game, mm-hmm. and I, I'm looking at my notes from the game four, and the only thing I have is just a goat emoji. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a goat emoji because, bro, that was like probably the weirdest like master class of a game yeah. I've ever seen. Because it wasn't like he went out there and dropped 40, 15 and eight, 40, 15, 10. Yeah. He just he had 22 points, had 20 rebounds. I just feel like when I watched that game, he, LeBron was not going to let us lose that game. LeBron went out there and did whatever he needed to do as far as rebounding. He took a couple key charges, had a couple yep. blocks. Just And when we needed him, it's crazy because when we needed him the most, he came through. But up until that point, I was screaming at my TV <laughs> like, LeBron, can you get the ball? Please yeah. just get the ball. Like It just felt like he was just letting it go by, letting mm-hmm. Austin Reeves do this, letting – all these other people on the team, I'm like, LeBron, just take the ball, please. Right. Take us home. But, you know, I have faith, yeah. and that's exactly what he did. So, um, that, I mean, game four, it was it was a slugfest, but, you know, we pulled that one out. And, honestly, if I'm being honest, I fully expected us to lose a uh, game. Was that game five? Mm-hmm. I, I didn't think we were going to close it out in game five. Going back home to Memphis, I feel like um, they're a great home team already. Yeah. So, that, along with the fact that we love – like, when we're not – having our backs against the wall we kind of relax a little bit Memphis their backs are against the wall so you know they're going to come out strong so I just I knew we were going to lose that game the only thing I'm really concerned about is the fact that our team looks very tired like LeBron looks very very gas yeah Anthony Davis looks like our team looks gas so that's one thing that concerns me a little bit especially if we end up playing the Warriors in the next round not to get too ahead of myself but if we end up Mm. playing the Warriors next round it's gonna be a little bit concerning that fatigue factor. So that's that's gonna be interesting to see. But we're gonna I feel like we're gonna close it out in six. Yeah, I like you said, I, I think I had texted somebody that I was like, I don't know if LeBron still got that that takeover, you know. It felt like mm-hmm. every single possession down the stretch in game four was like, All right, now's the time, like get a ball to Braun, watch out. He would drive and he's doing these wild like, whipping the passes across the <laughs> right. lane to like really and AR, and it's like, 
I don't know, man. At this point, you need to just take it up on whoever's down there. Um, mm-hmm. but look, like you said, when it mattered the most, like Batman, he came and he delivered. So, yeah, yeah, um, and you know, over time, he has a couple of clutch buckets. He had the N one, you know, flexing it out to the crowd. So, on Dylan Brooks, yeah, <laughs> who Dylan still Brooks. ain't said nothing to the media, oh, bro. He's so co- bro. Can I say something real quick? <laughs> yeah. Listen, I. If you're going to be a troll, if you're going to be a villain, if you're going to be one of those Pat Beverly, Eli Apple, one of those type of guys, bro. Own it. You ha- own, own it, it bro. I, bro, if he came out there after the game was like, fresh that shot was luck, bro. Like, he like he couldn't do that again on me. I would respect it way more than you just not talking to the media, bro. It's either you double down on it or you pay respects like, you know what? He made a good shot. I respect it. Nothing I can do. Like, right. you got to own it. But don't don't not talk to the media bro that's corny that was mad corny he's doing all that and what what i really don't like about it the most is that he came out and was like feels like the media is portraying him as a villain like you did that to yourself bro you played wanted heel. This. you played yeah, you heel. wanted this this is what right. you wanted you poke bears bro you said right. you poke bears that's, this is what you that's wanted your, this is what you said right like how are you going to turn that and try to say that people are trying to make you the villain you started all of this so you have to take what comes with it. And like you said, guys like Pat Bev, who do all that, you know, talking and yapping and, you know, the agitators, they yeah. always will own up to it. And some people think it's corny, right? They come out, they say whatever afterwards, but it's like, it's, I, it. I think it's authentically him. Like he's just being a competitor. And at the end of the day, people in the league know what it is, right? Like you're, you playing it up a little bit, <clears throat> but to do all of that talking and then, now that you're down three one three two, it's like uh, I don't got nothing don't to say to the media. I don't want to speak to the media now. Before like, you were running on. in front of the camera, you well, you was running to talk to the cameras when y'all won that game and it was one one. But it just right. shows. This just shows me that this is a character, bro. Like this ain't right. this isn't who really who he is. Like Patrick Beverly, that's who he is. Draymond, mm-hmm. like that's who he is. Right. Dylan Briggs, he's a character, bro. He's right. He's a character. Like you said, people they was getting so many quotes off of him. He was doing it, you know. Pre media, like pre game media exposure, he's talking to him at shoot around, post game, whatever. It's mm-hmm. like all of a sudden now he can't be bothered to be in front of the camera. Um, right. But you look like I saw somebody talking about the same thing, right? Like guys like Draymond or Pat Bev. It's like they got their own podcast now. They'll go and they'll find the camera, they'll turn it on themselves and start talking about it. So it's like they're not running from any of it, right? And they, mm-hmm. I think Draymond even brought it up on his pod. Like it's not always fun to be the villain, right? Like, you get booed everywhere. Like people don't like you the way that you like other, you know, top stars kind of get, you know, right. general respect from all NBA fan bases. But again, it's like if you're gonna go down that route, bro, own it. Don't, you know, don't half step into it. So mm-hmm. that I think is and you know, all of that aside, just going to Dylan Brooks on the court as a whole, like, bro has gotta stop shooting the ball like he's been shooting. Like, I don't know who in the organization has given him this green light, but they need to like, bro, turn it off. Yeah, <laughs> he could not yeah. be able to take this many threes <laughs> in a playoff series. When he has the ball in his hands, I relax. <laughs> I am <laughs> at ease. I am not worried about anything when he has the ball in his hand. And when I see him shoot it, I'm like, thank you, Anthony Davis, get this rebound. Cause you know it's breaking. But yeah, I <clears throat> yeah, man. It is. I want to see what his like what his stats are shooting this whole series. But like, I know in Game Four he went one for seven from three. It's like as good as you are on the the defensive end, and I do think he's like genuinely a a quality you know perimeter defender. Like he gets physical. He's not necessarily the most athletic guy, but he'll sit in the chair. He'll do the dirty work. Right. Like you mm-hmm. need guys like that on your team. But you don't need those same guys going one for seven from three. Yeah, you don't just don't shoot. Like if he just didn't shoot, he'd be way more of an asset than he is on the court. So he just needs to stop. Or if you're gonna shoot, because I get like we're leaving him open on purpose, obviously. Mm-hmm. Like we're gonna have to give up something. We're gonna live with the Dylan Brooks three. So if you're gonna take two wide open threes, like I guess no one will be mad at you. But it's like, bro, you're shooting like one for seven from three. Why are you taking seven threes? Like you, mm-hmm. you can't shoot, bro. But, yeah, and, and going back to game three where the you know the Lakers came out <laughs> crazy, was it 32 to nine in the first yeah. quarter, 35-9? Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that was because to start that, you know, Dylan Brooks is shooting crazy. You know, he has a big shot diet in the first quarter, and he's bricking a lot of that. He finished that game three for 13, one for five from three. So they're gonna have to address that like for the rest of the series, but just generally if they're gonna look to keep him 
this offseason, like, there's far too many games where I watch the Grizzlies where, like, Dylan Brooks has the green light to just pull so many shots. And it's like, it's not you. It doesn't need to be you for this team to be successful. Honestly, they would be more successful if that wasn't you at all. So He's not going to stop shooting. You saw what he said uh, after this last game. I think he said, like, I'm going I'm to get hot. One of, he said something like, I'm going to get hot one of these games. I'm going to go off and make, like, four or five, something like that. So, he, in his mind, he's not going to stop shooting, which I'm happy with. Shoot all day, bro. You can yeah. take 30 shots a game and be happy. Right. If I but, was a um, Lakers fan, I would be the same way. Yeah, but speaking of, I guess another worry I will say, speaking of bad shooting, LeBron James has been awful from three this series. Like, mm-hmm. he, I think he's shooting, the last time I checked it, it was 18%, and that was before the game five. So it's probably way worse now. I don't think he made a three last game. So that thing, that's a little concerning, the fact that he's shooting at such a high volume and missing so much. And on a lot of the shots you can see, he he's shooting it with no legs. Like he's mm-hmm. just. I feel like this this is my thing. I'm starting to realize with LeBron how we were talking about in the regular season. He would take possessions off on the defensive end. That's how he would get his rest. It seems like now he's kind of because he's been playing solid defense. I haven't really seen many times where he's like lost his man or like not closed out. Besides that one game with Dylan Brooks, he had that dagger three. But a lot of times it seems like he's taking his rest on the offensive end of the court, mm-hmm. which meaning like giving Austin Reeves the ball, letting him run the offense, let D'Lo run the offense. Or when he gets the ball, instead of trying to drive, get to the basket, he just kind of shoots a, like, whatever three from, like, two steps behind a three-point line. It's just bricking. So a lot of the shots you see when he's tired, he doesn't have any legs on his shot. So I guess that's a little bit of a concern um, because, like I said, it's, it goes into the, to, into the fatigue, like, being tired because – I mean, that's the easiest shot. When you play basketball, that's the easiest shot when you're tired. Let's just, let me just chuck a three. Like, let me not try to drive, get an actual good look. Let me just shoot a three. So, I guess that's a little bit of a concern moving forward. In the playoffs, he's shooting shooting 16% from three. Oh, I just found it. Yeah. <laughs> 16.7. That's, yeah, bro. A round up, 17. 17. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, uh, yeah. That's that atrocious. But I definitely agree with your point about you know, it definitely seems like he's starting to take possessions off on offense. Um, and like you said, down the stretch, it seems like he's giving the ball up to guys like, you know, Austin Reeves, D'Angelo Russell, Dennis Schroeder, and they're like trying to run the offense through them, which mm-hmm. to an extent, right, like that was a game, game four. Um, like the Lakers don't win that game without D'Lo hitting those three straight threes in the fourth quarter there. So like, that was a huge, a huge swing of momentum for that that game particularly, um, but yeah, it's. I don't know. It feels like he's really trying to space out that motor as much as he can. Um, so like I, like we said, you know, like he had the opportunity to like take that game over multiple possessions in a row, and it was only when it was absolutely <laughs> necessary to yeah. take the shot and go at it. And again, he got it, but um, that's uh, definitely gonna be something to, to to continue to look out for. Not just for for this series, and if the Lakers are able to advance, like he's gonna have to shoot better um, because at the end of the day, right, you need your best playing at their best if you want to, you know, win a championship. And it's great that you know Rui has been one of the hottest players in the playoffs this this entire postseason, um, and we've gotten good games out of Austin Reeves and D'Lo has had his moments, but. At the end of the day, it's going to have to be AD and LeBron that are are carrying the load for this Lakers team, especially if they're going to, you know, beat whoever comes out of that Kings Warriors series because that's going to be a, a great matchup and a tough one. Um, and the Western Conference Finals is going to be probably even harder than that. So he's going to have to get it going um, from deep and to to you know really be able to to lead this team further. Yeah, it's um. It's gonna be really, really interesting, man. I, I'm not gonna lie, I'm rooting for the Kings because I'm just I'm just thinking about the matchups. Like I, like I said, I genuinely believe we close this game out today in game six. I think mm-hmm. we close this game out or the series out, I should say. But I'm just thinking of the matchups. If the Warriors were to win, LeBron has to guard somebody. Cause I like I like when LeBron doesn't really have to guard someone because then he could use a lot of that energy on the offensive end, which we need sometimes. But mm-hmm. in series where he is forced to defend someone, 
it seems like in this one, I feel like a lot of his energy is spent on the defensive end. Like even looking at his like like his production, his I mean best game was actually in the loss. He had twenty eight not his best yep. game, his best like scoring game mm-hmm. was in the loss when he had twenty eight points. But um like other than that it's been twenty one, twenty five, twenty two, which is fine when we have others step up, but it's like there's times where I need LeBron to take the game over offensively. And if he's using a lot of his energy on the defensive end, it's going to be tough for him to do it on the offensive end. So I'm just thinking about the Warriors matchup, and I'm like, okay, AD on – well, who who do the Warriors – the Warriors normally start the Looney. I mean, they've been having Draymond come off the bench, but – Yeah, it's like, been Steph, Clay, Wiggins – or Steph, Clay, Poole, Wiggins, and uh, Looney. So then Brian would have to guard Wiggins. I feel like he would have to. Like I'm, it's, just, I'm just, it's interesting. I just, I'm the matchups to me is going to be really, really interesting in that series. I just hope it gets yeah. to the point where LeBron will have enough energy to hold his down on the offensive end as well as the defensive end. So yeah, there's going to be, be a lot of time. screens and a lot of off ball movement. Exactly, exactly. it's can't. a lot of movement. You can't leave these guys open. For, you cannot leave these guys open from three. That's the part that concerns me the most. Like All right. and honestly, have that's, lapses. that's whether it's the Kings or the Warriors, is there's gonna be it's a true. lot yeah. of a lot of DHOs, a lot of screens, a lot of pick and rolls, a lot of off-ball screens. Um and whichever team gets there, the pace is like is going up another level. Like both of those teams yeah. play super fast. So like I said it's definitely gonna be hard for him to take rest on the defensive end just because it's gonna be at such a such a different like frenetic pace for that series regardless of, of which team you know advances out of there mm-hmm. um but you know before we really dive into that at Warriors King series just want to touch on the Grizzlies a little bit more here because um you know it's definitely tough that they uh you know are dealing with the injuries to, to Stephen Adams and Brandon Clark um and I think that probably is hindering them to an extent but um you know it's this will be the second year in a row that, you know, obviously they have a John Moran injury in the postseason. Um, and granted, I don't think it's affecting his play that much because he's still no. – is definitely getting his, you know, since he had the the tough fall on the hand injury. But um, I don't know. I feel like this would be a, a tough pill to swallow for Grizzlies fans um, if they aren't able to get out of this first-round matchup. Now, you know, granted, it's – Unfortunate that they kind of, you know, run into a Lakers team that's definitely better than their record suggests. And especially, you know, one of the better second half teams after the the trade deadline. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, the time will tell depending on how far the Lakers can go in this postseason if they're able to get out, get out of this first round. But, you know, a two seed going down in the first round is never an easy pill to swallow for a franchise. And um, it's hard to really pinpoint it on anything in particular other than, you know, it just feels like at times when the Lakers, like that offensive engine is going. And like like we said earlier, if everybody is getting there, it's D'Lo, Dennis, you know, AR, Rui. Then it's like you're dealing with all of that on top of LeBron and AD. It just seems like it can be overwhelming at times as well as, you know, Jaron has played in this series as well as Ja and Desmond Bain have played. It, it just feels like it might be too much for them to to deal with. Yeah, I agree. Um it is definitely a little tough, but like you said, I mean, I wouldn't really. I mean, like you said, the Lakers aren't a real seven seed. I feel like after the trade deadline, I feel like we're, we're they're not playing a traditional seventh seed. So the whole like they're losing to a seven seed as a two seed, it's like, yeah, but it's a little bit more context context mm-hmm. into it, especially when you add in the fact that Stephen Adams, Brandon Clark is not playing. So yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I I definitely wouldn't panic if they were to lose this series. I feel like they could. They can come in the next year saying, all right, we're going to be – we could be more focused. We could have Ja not miss a chunk of the season. We could have Brandon Clark healthy, Stephen Adams healthy. Yep. And then we could try to run this back again with a real – like with a real fair chance. So, I definitely wouldn't panic if I was the Grizzlies. I mean, I guess you could say it's a little concerning, but I wouldn't really panic that much, even if they wish to lose the series. Yeah, what do you think? I've seen a lot of people have different takes on just how Ja plays, um, especially after that, that last game. He almost had that. You know, crazy fall, um, mm-hmm. you know, when, when LeBron took the charge. Um, is that anything you would be concerned about if you're a Grizzlies fan? I, I've kind of gone back and forth about it in my head about – I feel like the argument around, you know, super athletic guards especially um, kind of gets out of hand really quick and they do the whole, you know, he's going to have to change how he plays. And obviously I get it to an extent, but 
Um, with Ja, it just seems like it's on another level sometimes how <laughs> reckless he gets in the air. Um, and obviously it leads to some of the great highlights that he's been able to put together in such a short time. But, um, you know, as we've seen, like he – it's a long way down when you come up that high. Um, mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Is that something that concerns you just as an NBA fan as a whole? Oh, yeah, 100%. It concerns me for his health. Like, I understand mm -hmm. that's the way he plays. I, I get that. But it's like there's some times where it's very necessary that he needs to jump that high to finish his acrobatic layup to finish over taller defenders. But there's times, like, on the, Le the LeBron charge, like, what is your plan? Like, if you actually look at the play, like, he's jumping up – and he has no plan. Like he's just like he, he just looks like he wants to see how high he can jump, bro. Honestly. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's definitely concerning. Um, because he already has a problem with staying healthy. He already has a problem with. I feel like every postseason the past couple of years has been he gets hurt in the postseason, whether it's a knee, it's a hand, whatever it is. But it's definitely a little bit concerning. I feel like he has to learn to play. I don't want to say scale it back down a lot because again, that's his game. Like that's how mm -hmm. he plays. But to some extent you got to just tone it out a little bit or know when is the right times to like take off and try to dunk on someone or take off through his acrobatic layup. Cause like I said, a lot of times it just seems like it's, it's unnecessary. Like he's, it's just recklessness going to the basket. So for his health wise, it's definitely a little bit concerning for me. For sure. Um, yeah. And I know we already kind of touched on it. So we can, we can really dive into this Warriors King series now. Cause um they said, well, I, I kind of agree. I think the Lakers will probably close it out at home. Um, again, knowing that they can close it out tonight, right? You you want to, again, maximize your rest. LeBron is aware of this more than probably anybody else in the postseason. So they mm -hmm. don't want it to, you know, hang around with the Grizzlies and let it go to a game seven and have to go back to Memphis because game seven in general is not something you wanted to see, especially on the road because anything can happen in, a, you know, one game sample size. But you know, looking at this Warriors and Kings series, um, I know I had Kings in seven going in. I think this series, this series can still go to seven, but I think the Kings have, have lost their chance. They had their window, right? Like you win the first two at home, great. I'm not mm -hmm. expecting you to win the next two on the road, but in the first game with no Draymond suspension, like, you know, Warriors really had it going. The Kings struggled from the field. Malik Monk didn't have a great game. Fine. Game four was their game to win. Like, Agreed. everything is lining up. Agreed. You have the Steph Curry timeout. They don't have any more timeouts. They're giving the – like, they're just – they keep opening the door for the Kings, and they just cannot close the deal there. Um, and just watching it, it felt like that was their chance, and they just let it slip away. Um, and at the end of the day, right, like, Harrison Barnes got a great look. You can't really ask for a better look. He doesn't knock it down, but they had multiple opportunities before that um, to, to take the lead back in that game. And they just, just were not able to, um, despite, you know, De'Aaron Fox having a great game, you know, he's been phenomenal all series, but um, I really do believe that championship DNA is a real thing. Um, and so knowing that, okay, right. It's a two, two series. We go back to Sacramento the, the Warriors know, like, game five is that pivotal game in every series. We have that uh, kind of that to be expected, that clay performance that everybody's expecting from um, from him in, in a series like this. And he kind of gets it going in the first half there. Steph is doing ridiculous video game things like mm -hmm. he always does. Um, and, again, another close game for the Kings. But, you know, when it comes down the stretch, the Warriors just feel like they make more plays. We had a Draymond game, which is crazy. He put up 21, <laughs> which is – I think it's the first time he's put up 20 since 2019, which is crazy. I've seen that. That's <laughs> insane. <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, it, as fun as the series has been and as tight as it's been, um, you know, game six <clears throat> in Golden State does not feel like that's a game. The Warriors are going to lose. It would take a – like a super – huge. take – it would take a Jimmy Butler-level game. <laughs> out of deer and fox <laughs> honestly <Yeah. laughs> if they wanted to win that game and uh i just don't see the, the warriors giving that one up on their home floor so um going back to the game four um i just wanted to say this 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 is the definite reason why i picked the warriors in six because i just feel like like you said that championship dna that championship experience is it really showed in certain points of that game and game five 
Like the inexperience from the Kings really showed on a couple possessions late into the game where whether it was a fast break, they had like a, a three on two, two on one, and they either turned the ball over or just didn't convert or just poor shot selection down the stretch. So like the in, inexperience really, really showed for the Kings. And um, yeah, man, like honestly, I said game five, I said whoever wins game five is going to win the series. And the Warriors were able to steal one. I finally won a road game. So, like you said, it's tough going back for game six in in the Warriors arena. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really not looking good. It's really not looking good for the Kings, man. I, I think the Warriors are going to win this one in six. Game six, Clay could come out. You never know. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. know, man. I'm rooting for – I really hope the Kings do pull it out. I hope I'm wrong. I want the Kings to win this series. But it's it's really not looking good, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough. This Kings team is, and and look, if they lose this series in six, I don't think it's a failure by any means, right? Like that's a tough matchup for anybody in the West. Mm. Um, and to to play this series as tight as it is, like even if it's only six games, like the only game that really got out of hand for the Kings was was Game Three. Uh, but other than that, every game has been tight, back and forth, down the wire. Like they're deserve to be here and they've proved it um and the team is only going to get better like they i think basically everyone that plays meaningful minutes to them outside of harrison barnes like 27 or 26 and under yeah they're um, a very young team so they're like either in there like just entering their prime or like they still have some years to go um really really love what i've seen from keegan murray in the last two games it feels like i don't know what mike brown said to him after after game three but he has turned it on um, and he started shooting his skin off the ball in game four. He had it going early. Um, and it, it felt like there was times where it was like, you know, he had a, he had a couple of catch and shoots, and it was like, I mean, you give me the ball, I'm taking it off the dribble. Like, he really found his his rhythm. Um, and he's a rookie. Like, he's the only rookie that has this, you know, big of a role out of any playoff team. Um, mm-hmm. He's making the most of that opportunity. This is going to be a great, you know, learning experience for him to have this, you know, you know postseason postseason run you know so early on so he's only going to get better from here um and something that people were talking about is you know like is this a style of play that would attract free agents right like super fast paced offensive focus you know you, you have the reigning coach of the year and mike brown guys love to play for him it seems like you know the way that they've really rallied around him um you know all it takes is you know, one big name person to come in. And it's like, you pair that with De'Aaron and Sabonis and then, you know, a really strong young core they have. And it's like, this team is scary. Um, so definitely if they are, if they drop, you know, game six or game seven, um, I don't think the Kings have anything to be ashamed about how they fought in this series. And, you know, just generally the show that they put on for NBA fans, like this series alone is to me, one of the best first round series I've ever seen. Just like, a game by game basis is like so back and forth. And a big part of the reason why I think the first round of this playoffs has been, I really don't know that I can remember a first round being this exciting. Yeah, um, me either. It's yeah, been great. And, yeah. And this series is, has, you know, carried a lot of that, that excitement. So definitely, definitely tough for the, the Kings. Like I said, I think that game five drop is, is, hurting them and, and probably I, I think the Warriors will close down six I think you, you pretty much said the same thing so um potentially setting up a Steph LeBron round two matchup which oh what are, my god the ratings for that is going to be crazy through the roof through the roof <laughs> the narrative is going to be worse but the, <laughs> the yeah, 100% crazy. oh my god but yeah I, I agree with pretty much everything you said in the Kings man honestly in a series that's so close so back and forth it really just comes down to a play here and there, missed yep. opportunities. Like if Harrison Barnes hits that shot, this series could basically be over. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, but you could say the same for the Warriors too. If Andrew Wiggins makes that shot, yep. I mean, like it's just it's, it That's goes down. That's basketball. It happens, right? Yeah, exactly. It goes down to missed opportunities and um, yeah, just inexperience sometimes for the Kings. Like you saw it show a little bit in a lot of these games that they lost the inexperience, but. Like you said, they have a real promising future, so I wouldn't be too mad if they. If I was a Kings fan, I wouldn't be mad if we lost this series because they have a real promising future. All the players are gonna grow and get better. So, yeah, the, the Kings are definitely in a real good spot. And I, like, I've never really, no one never really talked about that. Um, the fact that a 
big free agent could possibly look at the Sacramento Kings as a destination. But if you really think about it, it's actually yeah, it's a good fit. I mean, if you think about, it, they're a California team, so it's not mm-hmm. like Cali, right? So, You're not in the middle of nowhere. Exactly, it's not like it's Milwaukee, or you like you don't want to go play in Milwaukee, really. So, good team, good young players, good head coach, fast pace, obviously good arena, good crowd, good fan base. Right. So, I mean, yeah, it's it's that's definitely a, a sneaky good um free agent destination. I never really thought about that. So, yeah, something that definitely to be looked out for, not necessarily for this off season. The free agent pool is a little bit you know smaller, but next off season there's a lot of heavy hitters up for free agency. And even just if they look to make a play in the you know trade market um, with some of the, the younger assets that they have, right? Like they're in a phenomenal spot to so just, you know, kind of hold and they don't need to force anything. Right? Like with the team that you had here, like obviously health played a big factor, but you're the three seed in a super tough Western conference. Right. And mm-hmm. like we said, they're younger. They're only going to get better from here. Um, so definitely a, a bright future for the Kings ahead. And I, I don't think they even need like a, a huge like they don't need like a top five caliber mm-hmm. like I feel like if they just get a solid all-star caliber player I mean they they could be they could be a real contender yeah yeah not for sure they could use like a, a wing to replace HB like it doesn't have right. to be like because right they have other vets on the team out there's playing like De'Aaron is basically a vet now right yeah, exactly like, Sabonis is kind of getting that veteran presence there um, so you bring in like a, a better wing to have like a three and D guy there. Um, like they have some brewing in Sacramento for sure. 100%. Looking over to the other Western conference series. Um, this one's wrapped up here. The Suns uh, take out the Clippers in five games. Um, it's come out now that Kawhi has a torn meniscus. So, you know, prayers with him. Hopefully he can make another, you know, recovery process there. You know, he's just really been unfortunate with, especially his leg injuries the last few years, obviously had the quad stuff while he was, you know, in San Antonio, um, dealt with the ACL last or not last year, year before last, um, and now a torn meniscus. So, um, you know, prayers for him to have a good recovery there. But um, at the end of the day, the Suns team, it just came down to talent, right? Like, you know, you're missing PG, you're missing Kawhi. There's only so much you can do in that, mm-hmm. that circumstance. But um Still a lot of takeaways for the Clippers, I think, from the series, right? Like, Russell Westbrook, like, silenced a lot of the hate, I think. And part of that is probably due to the fact that you get the best version of Westbrook when he becomes the focal point, right? So it's like taking away those guys amplified his game and allowed him to play more free around the court. If you watch it, like, uh, especially in game five, Right, like it is a live by Westbrook, die by Westbrook thing. He's not going to stop shooting, even if it's not dropping. He's going to have turnovers because he's playing so fast and so high pace. So it comes to the territory, but at the end of the day, like you would want a guy like Westbrook on your team just off of, you know, how intense he plays. So that's good to see. He obviously still has a lot of gas in the tank. I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon, which it felt like was kind of some of the speculation around his Lakers tenure was like, is he even like a, a player you want on your team anymore. And I think a lot of that needs to get put to bed for sure. Um, But something I have here, um, which is interesting is this series for the Suns, like a lot of it was the D book show. Like he took over these games and even in the elimination game, what do you have? Like 17, 18 points. And yeah, went for almost 50, but yeah, like 17 or 18 in third quarter alone. Yeah, yeah, um, he went, he went crazy. He was going off, and so <laughs> it feels like you know, just off again, super small sample size. They haven't played a ton of games together, but like, and a lot of this has to do with how KD plays. But it's like he's kind of taken that one B, almost one A, one B role to D book, um, and he just gets his shots whenever he gets them. He's always going to be hyper efficient. So like. He doesn't need a ton of shots to put up 25, 30 points. Um, but if D-Book is playing like this, that takes so much pressure off of Chris Paul and, and DeAndre Ayton because it's like, I don't even need to look for to y'all for a ton of points. You have Devin Booker and KD will handle that. All I need y'all to do is, um, you know, 
it needs to just, you know, continue to be a presence on both sides of the ball in the interior. Um, and Chris Paul is going to facilitate the ball as he always was run an offense um, and hit a couple of good middies when he needs to. So mm-hmm. his son's team is looking very, very, very scary. Yeah, uh, 100%. I agree. Um, the Suns, I feel like Devin Booker loves playing with Kevin Durant because of who Kevin Durant is, the attention that he attracts. Mm-hmm. Devin Booker's not going to see any double teams. He's not going to face the teams. You know he don't like double teams. Yeah, he don't like double teams. <laughs> Stop all that double team. <laughs> but not, he's not going to face double teams. He's not going to face the team's best defender. So that just opens up a whole new world for him as far as, like, scoring the basketball and being able to play free. So, yeah, I mean – yeah, it's kind of like a one A one B thing because Devin Booker is a is a is a one caliber player. Like he's yeah. not a number two; he's a one caliber player. So when you pair that with obviously a Kevin Durant, it's just it's tough. He's just gonna. I mean, it's kind of like how when Kevin Durant went to the Warriors a little bit, you can't focus solely on Kevin Durant, even though he's obviously the best player. But you got to worry about Steph, you got to worry about Clay, got to worry about all these other people. Kevin Durant attracts so much attention that Devin Booker is just like he's able to feast. He's able to feast, but. And one thing that does concern me about the Suns is the fact that their lack of depth is is like really, really bad. Like yeah. they have to play their guys 40 plus minutes every single game if they want to win. Because if you think about it, they played a Kawhi-less, PG-less Clippers team and still had to play their guys, what, 45 plus minutes, 42 plus minutes a night. Mm-hmm. And with the injury history with Kevin Durant, Chris Paul, that's a little bit concerning. So... I don't know. The, the lack of depth is is a real question mark, especially when they go into this series against the Denver Nuggets. So I, I'm gonna be interested to see how Monty handles the minutes, how their bodies will hold up. Because I don't know if that's a sustainable way to play when you're just playing what six, seven, seven, really seven deep, right? You have like yeah. that that star five, and then it's like a Kogi obviously is getting some good run again, and then mm-hmm. Biombo, and like that's really it. Like campaign isn't getting a lot of minutes. Uh, you know, we saw He's some hurt. Damian. Yeah, we saw some Damian Lee and um, Landry Shamit there in Game Five. But you know, it's like five, seven minutes, something like that. So it's really a seven-man rotation, like you said. That's I don't think that's going to be sustainable. Um, exactly. It's like we're in the you know only going to be in the second round of Western Conference playoffs. Like you said, you know, Kevin Durant played forty-four minutes in Game Five. D. Book played forty-two. Chris Paul played thirty-seven. Aiden played thirty-six. So. Again, and we might as well just really dive into this whole Suns Nuggets series because I think this is the series of the second round because there's so many interesting matchups on both sides that, like, coaching is going to play such a huge factor in this series because when you look at the Suns, it's like, okay, great. We have D-Book. We have, um, you know, KD. We have A, we have Chris Paul. You know, we got it down on offense. Same time, who's guarding Jamal Murray? Right. That's something that you need to worry about. Who's guarding Jokic? If Aiden gets in foul trouble, can we rely on Biombo to play big minutes for us? If both of them get in foul trouble, what do you do? Right? Like you, like you said, then uh, on big bodies in general, because outside of the two of them, the probably the tallest guy is KD, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, exactly. It's like they're going to have to deal with matchups there. And then obviously on the flip side for the Nuggets, it's like you definitely are going to probably see a lot of Aaron Gordon on KD. It's like, mm-hmm. what do they do to keep Jokic out of these pick and roll actions? Because that's a death wish. You do not want him in any type of pick and roll activity as much as you can to keep him out of that. Um, and again, same thing. How are we going to guard D Book and KD? Um, <clears throat> what are they going to do to keep Aiden at bay? Because again, hopefully he needs to understand like he can take advantage of Jokic on the defensive end, right? Like he has the tool mm-hmm. set to be able to do that. Um, Again, so much of his energy is probably going to be spent trying to stop Aiden on the, the, the other side of the ball. So is it going to be, a, a I think, a great series just for these particular individual matchups that we're going to get to see? Yeah, I, I 100% agree. I just – it's interesting just because, like you said, both teams will be able to exploit the other team's biggest weakness, I feel like. And that's mm-hmm. the part that's going to be most interesting to see how these coaches adjust, how these players adjust. So – I don't know who I'm picking yet, but it's definitely going to be real interesting to see. This is good. This is definitely going to be probably the best second round series. Yeah, I'd, I'd say probably one of the best second round series they're going to be, especially in the West. Yeah, no, it is. It's shaping up to be a a dog fight for sure. Like you have so many heavy hitters, like and everybody looks like they're coming into form at the right time. Like 
Mm-hmm. Right. Like this Suns team is looking as dangerous as they looked. D book and KD are definitely on the same page and they're cooking. Um, Jamal Murray is back. You know, he's looking like he's got that, that, that playoff bubble vibe about him again. Mm-hmm. Aaron Gordon has been playing great for them. You know, they have good depth pieces there as well. Yoke is just absolutely ate go bears food in the first round. Um, Still got Michael Porter Jr. Right. So like, there is a lot, a lot of firepower on the court for both sides. Um, so I, that is my like my must see series for for this you know second round. I'm going to game two in Denver. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm excited to be there. I know the crowd is going to be crazy, mm-hmm. um, but it's just it's going to be a series that I I like you said I really don't know who I, I I would pick if I had to pick right now. I, I could easily see it going both ways. Um, and I said I think so much of it is going to come down to in series adjustments that you know, Michael Malone or Monty Williams is going to make to, again, you don't really stop any of these players, but a lot of it comes down to, like, what can you do to contain it, right? Um, mm-hmm. So, like, they guess whichever team can really figure out a way to slow down either, you know, MPJ, Jamal Murray, Jokic, or slow down, you know, KD and D-Book is the team I think is going to have to come out on top here. But that's a tall task for any coach to, to have to deal with just one of them you're dealing mm-hmm. with, with multiple at once. So, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot. I'm also curious to see how with this, like I said, with the minutes that they play with the Suns, the altitude up in Denver, are yep. they going to be able to hold up playing these 40, 42 minutes, especially someone like a Chris Paul, KD, like I said, with the injury history. So that's going to be a big, big factor. That's what I'm, I'm going to be watching. I want to see how they how they they divvy up the minutes. Um between everyone so it's gonna be real real interesting I, if i had to pick one i'm honestly leaning denver right now if i'm being completely honest i kind of like, am too what i saw from Jokic and murray in the first round like deandre ain't scares me right like he yeah. i think was an x i think i had him as an x factor coming into this series right like if he gets going mm-hmm. the whole offense gets going that wasn't even needed d book just got his regardless right all right He's an X factor on the opposite side of the floor in the series because he has the, the hardest assignment in the whole series, I'd say, right? Like you're stopping the two time reigning MVP, who we just saw make a three time defensive player of the year, whether you, you know, whatever y'all's feelings are about Rudy Gobert, made him look bad. Like mm-hmm. he made him look bad in space. He had no answers. On the block, he had no answers. He's getting bullied underneath the rim. Like, this is that's what you do, right? You're a rim protecting big. You right. can't stop Jokic. And so, somebody who has even a lesser tool set on the defensive end, like, bro, you have to answer the call because. And you can't get in foul trouble because we don't have the bodies. Right. We, just, we don't have the body. We need you on the court. Right. Because if you get if you get down, I got to play Bismack. And if y'all, and both y'all get in foul trouble. <laughs> All right, both of them get in foul trouble. Like, Jokic is going to have – he's already going to have a field day, but it's like, bro, what do you do? Like, mm-hmm. it's, it's, yeah, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. I, I would not want to be either of these coaches right now. I know that they have a lot on their plate, you know, trying to game plan for both of these teams. But, um, yeah, if I had to pick right now, I would, I would also probably have the Nuggets just based off of what I saw in that first round. Like – Jamal Murray's it's back. Yeah, it is it's tough too because they're so reliant on their two guys to really go off. Like obviously Devin Booker is, is hot right now. Like he's mm-hmm. he he's playing like the best player in these playoffs right now, besides Jimmy Butler. But it's like, can you really fully rely on him and KD to combine for 65 points a game, 60 points a game every single night? Like I I don't know if that's fully sustainable. It just I feel like the Suns kind of give me the vibes of like those super teams that we were talking about, even though yeah. I, I wouldn't really classify them as that, but just the fact that they're so top heavy with no depth behind it. It's just, it's a little, it's a little worrisome for me. So yeah. I, I'm definitely leaning Denver right now. I feel like. Yeah, for sure. And um, even to go back to Denver's first round series, again, just to kind of put a ball on their season for the Timberwolves, right? Like Anthony Edwards definitely came out to play, uh, especially, you know, game four, game five, like he's leaving it all out on the court. Mm-hmm. Game four, 
boy. That man said he was not getting swept. He was not losing. <laughs> I, I res- Listen, I respect it. He said he was not getting swept. He'll do whatever he has to do to not get swept. I respect it. He really yeah. stepped up. Yeah, that, that last little snatch back on Aaron Gordon to, to ice the game there. Oh that was Queen. nasty. Yeah. That was nasty. Um, but – like I said, man, you bring in Rudy Gobert to, to up your defense, um, and he getting picked on in the first round. It's not a good look. <laughs> it's not a good look at all. Cat getting in foul trouble every game. I think he fouled out the last two games of the series. Mm-hmm. Um, so many questions for this team moving forward, and I, I think a lot of it starts with what – a lot of it surrounds Cat, right? You're really locked into Gobert. And we're going to have to spend too much time on it, but I know we kind of touched on it already. But going into the offseason, like, that feels like the domino that has to fall. And we just, you know, completely focus on, on Anthony Edwards here because, man, he's 21 and doing this stuff in the playoffs. Like, it's his team. Um, he's only going to continue to get better on both sides of the ball because we've seen him lock in on defense too. Um, so yeah, it, it's tough, but Jokic just had his way and, yeah. you know, it, it, it's hard to say, obviously like, he, you know, easily a top two center in the NBA, um, you know, two time reigning MVP. So it's like, who's stopping him anyway? Like it's a hard task to ask of anybody, but like you, you bring in Gobert and run two bigs. Like we talked about with the Cavs, like, what's the point of doing that if you're still going to get dominated on the interior, you know? Exactly. And that's why the Rudy Gobert trade just never really made sense because that whole two big lineup you can, you see can get exposed and it wasn't even exposed in the way that I thought it was going to get exposed as far as like picking roles, like with the with top tier guard play, especially in the West, it just got exposed with one. You can't guard him. You literally can't yeah, guard him. Just one big man being better than both of your big men. So it's just, <laughs> As the Rudy Gobert trade, it just never made sense. I just feel like him and Cat together is just never going to work. And it's unfortunate because, like you said, they might have to move off of Carl Anthony Towns just because they have the Rudy Gobert trade. So it's they're they're, they're in a real tough spot. I'm not really a, a, a fan of their future. I mean, Anthony Edwards is that guy. So I guess that you got something to look forward to if you're a Timberwolves fan as far as him being the number one over there because he clearly showed that he can be that guy that leads a team deep into the playoffs. But – you just need to have the right roster around him. Yeah, and, you know, before we even move off, I definitely want to, you know, give Nikhil Alexander-Walker some flowers because he actually stepped right. up. And mm-hmm. he was, you know, non-existent in, uh, you know, in uh, New Orleans. He couldn't never really, like, found consistent role there. Um, and he played some big minutes for them in this, this series. Ended up, you know, getting into the starting lineup hit a lot of big shots for them in game four. Like they might have something there, at least in a, you know, a really good role player out of him. So mm-hmm. um, you know, we're really happy to see that for him and his development, but yeah, it's going to be a, a tough off season for, for Minnesota for sure. Would not, not be the most exciting time to be a Minnesota fan. Um, yeah. You know, obviously Anthony Edwards is great, but where this team goes from here long-term in terms of trying to really compete, definitely got questions that got to get answered. You might have to make some tough decisions, real tough decisions. For sure. Last series that wrapped up last night, um, the Celtics um, take out the Hawks in six games. Um, Jason Tatum has a, had a huge performance in that game. Um, and down the stretch, for sure, um, their defense came to play. Um, I know the play that probably got shown the most that, at Trey Young trying to inbound the ball. It's like four different times. Yeah. <laughs> throw it off Marcus Smart, so – um, their defense definitely locked it in there down the end. Give definitely tip my cap to cap to to Trey Young for sure. Um, he made it a series out of this where it didn't seem like there there might be one. Um, you know he turned on that that, that ice tray for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he definitely had some some big games, especially in, obviously in, in Game Five uh, with with no Dejounte Murray going and getting it done in Boston down the stretch and ton of big shots and then the three at the end was crazy. But um, my, my biggest takeaway from the series, honestly, is I'm a little bit more concerned for the Celtics than I was going in. Um, and a lot of that is just due to their offensive inconsistencies at times when I watch them play. Like when you go back to game five, like that shouldn't even have 
been a, in a position to lose that game, right? Like so many turnovers there down the stretch, like really opened the door for Trey to make some of those big shots there. Um, and our offense just you know, kind of started to look stale. Um, and, you know, Jason Tatum has been really inconsistent for a back half of a lot of the regular season. And we saw a couple of inconsistent performances out of him, um, you know, in this series as well. Obviously finished out on a high note, but I think he only had 19 points in game five, which, mm-hmm. you know, we kind of talked about, you know, coming into to this postseason and just has been talked about really since their finals run last year. Like, he needs to be the best guy on the court for this team to, to you know, achieve the goals that they have set. So um, I'm a little more concerned for them. I, I thought that they would have an easier time, you know, taking out this Hawks team than they would. Um, but – Again, some of that is just, you know, Trey Young is, you know, he answered the call and definitely hit some big shots and and carried this team, especially in game five. But, um, yeah, I, I, I'm a little more concerned for the Celtics, especially with the, with the Sixers matchup. 100%. The Celtics was my pick to come out of the East. And um, just the way they handled these, like, the, the losses that they had, it just seems like, it's just dumb mistakes, dumb mental lapses, whether it be turnovers, whether it be mm-hmm. dumb fouls. They let Atlanta get back into the game. Yes, Trey Young had a big game, but it's just like, like you said, they shouldn't even be in that position to lose those type of games, especially right. if I was at home, right? It was at, at home. At home, no DeJounte Murray. Exactly. You, like, like, you got to close that. Just close. You're, uh, you're a way better team. Just close it out. So, I mean, stuff like that definitely worries me a little bit. Like you said, Tatum's inconsistency. It's a little bit of a problem because we've seen it even in last year's run where they went to the finals. Like it would be games where he'd come out and he'd have 35 and have a, a look like the best player in the world. And then it'll, it'll have games where he just either can't hit a shot or he's just not aggressive. It's like his in, he, they're only going to go as far as he takes them mm-hmm. because even in nights where he doesn't have it going and then say JB has it going, Tatum is still the guy where like I know I don't care if I don't have it going. I'm still going to shoot the ball. I'm still going to take these these crucial shots and. I don't know. He just needs to be more consistent if they want to make a deep, deep playoff run and eventually win the championship. So yeah. Um, so yeah, for for them going into this, you know, Sixers series, obviously huge that they didn't extend it out to an extra game. Um, because look, you want to, from a Celtics perspective, you want to give Joel as little rest as possible. You want to take mm-hmm. advantage of that. So, um, you know, huge that they were able to close it out. You know, as soon as they did and didn't let it go another game, but. Um, Obviously, Joel's health is the biggest, you know, question mark coming into the series. I know Doc had that quote about him potentially being like 50 percent by the time the series started. So, you know, if he misses a game or two, that's going to be a huge blow for, you know, this this South or this Sixers team, excuse me, um, to, to deal with. But, you know, if he can come back and be 80 percent, 85 percent, like that's going to be it's generally he's going to give people problems and mm-hmm. you know like obviously the Celtics have you know some decent personnel in terms of trying to to match up and stop that but at the end of the day it's you can get isos with Al Horford or Rob Williams like Joel yeah. B is going to want that so they're going to have to send bodies um they have the spacing and the shooting for it um we saw what happened when the next the Nets you know just tried to double and trap him off the ball you know, all the other Sixers players really stepped up in that that first round series. So um, if he can get back healthy, uh, the Sixers, I think, have a real good chance of obviously not just getting out of this round, but, you know, take on the winner of Knicks Heat might make the finals and, you know, this might be be their year. So really for either of these teams, they both should be looking their chops and understanding what's in front of them. You know, the the big dog, right, the Bucks are out. Um, Mm -hmm. so like not to overlook any teams, but you know, the path to the finals just got that much easier, right? The Eastern conference finals is not going to be this crazy, you know, dog fight with the bucks. Like you thought it would be going to be, you know, you're going to be running into the Knicks or the heat who no disrespect to them, you know, coming into the postseason, we're just not viewed in that same level of those, that top three, you know, tier list there in the East. So neither of them um, was supposed to make it out of the first round, according to pretty much everyone. So. They definitely right. could be looking at this series as like whoever wins this should be the winner should be the ones that's come out of the East. So I, I definitely agree with what you're saying. They both should take this this series like not lightly. They're obviously they're not gonna take it lightly, but it comes down to Joel Embiid's health 
And I feel like the others for the, for Philadelphia being able to step up, especially if he's not 100%. Because regardless, if Joel Embiid is on the court, he's going to attract a lot of defensive attention. So it's gonna they're going to need the others to definitely step up. They're going to need to hit shots. Maxie's going to have to be playing well. James Harden's going to have to be playing well. But, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a great series. It's going to be a great series. I hope Joel Embiid is 100%. Mm-hmm. I want to see everybody at, at full strength playing in this series. Um. I, I mean, I'm going to stick with my pick, Boston. I feel like Boston is just a, a great team. Like I said, Jason Tatum's inconsistencies worry me a little bit, but I just feel like both teams know what's at stake here with this series. Both teams know, like you said, the Bucks that got eliminated, that the Pats just got a lot easier. So they're, I don't feel like they're going to play around. I don't feel like they're going to have those mental lapses, those errors, take, team, take this team lightly. So... I like Boston's chances, but it's definitely going to be a dogfight. I, I would not be surprised at all if, if Philly pulls this out, especially if Joel comes back and he's 90% of the player that he normally is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And something that, you know, has kind of really been a theme of the Celtics all year, right? They, they are shooting an even higher volume of threes than they were in the last season, ever since Joe Mazzulla has become the head coach. Um, and just, again, in a playoff atmosphere, like a live-by-the-three, die-by-the-three approach, um, like that can cost you a game if you just have an off night because mm-hmm. you know they're doing so many swing passes to try to find open threes, open threes, open threes. So, um, yeah, like so much is really just down to Joel's help. It's tough to really gauge without really knowing, a, you know, kind of more more of an update on his injury and kind of how he's feeling. But um, look, time for for Tyrese to step up, James to step up, Tobias to step up, like they still have the talent to compete. Like they can still be able to, to hang in with the Celtics team without Joel. Um, obviously they, they definitely be the worst, worst team on the court, but um, it's not too far fetched. I couldn't see them at least keeping it competitive again, especially if the Celtics come in and have a rough shooting night or two. Um, like, look, all I got to do is, is try to find a way to get Joel health because, Right. At the end of the day, even if they he comes back after game one or game two and they're down 0-1-0-2, like that's not an insurmountable deficit, you know, for mm-hmm. you to deal with. Um, and at the end of the day, right, like he comes back in game three, like they're in Philly, right? He might just get two back and then boom, it's an even series all over again. So um that has to be their 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 main focus is making sure that he's healthy. But um Another going to be an interesting series. And like, like we said, both of these teams need to be aware of what's at stake with, you know, with the Bucks out. Like this is, could essentially be like the Eastern Conference finals for either of these teams. Right. Yeah, um, I fully agree. Yeah. Um, lastly, just kind of like wrapping up on, you know, the Hawks season. Um, I kind of mentioned this before, but I think the future is, is bright with, with Quinn Snyder there at the helm. Um, I really liked what I saw from him in this series, just from a coaching perspective, how he was directing a lot of traffic there on the sideline. Um, you know, I think he'll really be able to unlock, you know, train DeJounte as a backcourt. Um, so I'm interested to see what a full off season, you know, with him there being able to work with that team looks like and really get his stuff situated there in Atlanta. So, um, you know, definitely I think good things ahead for that backcourt. Um, you know, they're in Atlanta. Yeah, 100. Like, like you said, I, I really want to see it with a full season because um, I, I don't like when Trey has to be the guy where he has the ball in his hands all of the time. So mm-hmm. even when they first traded for Dejounte, I like that trade for him to give him some pressure, some relief off the ball. Because you've seen like in those series when Trey, Trey struggled, those series when like the Heat or something like that, they had long, lengthy defenders, and they know he's going to have the ball all the time. So they just it was easy to make it tough on him. So give him that that relief a little bit. Have a full season with that backcourt under Coach Schneider. I feel like I feel like the Hawks are going to be they have a, they have a promising future. They have a real promising future. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And look, speaking of coaching, I'll kind of touch on the playoff series. We had some some coaching <laughs> changes here over the last couple of weeks. Steven Silas is out in Houston. They just signed Ime Udoka, which I think <laughs> is a great hire. I think a lot of a lot of people had speculated that it was probably going to be Nick Nurse, but Mm-hmm. They went out and got got Ime, which I think is going to be huge for that team and for the development of some of their young guys with Jalen Green, um, you know, Alperen Shangun, and, and then Kevin Porter Jr. as well. Um, something that interested me out of his initial press conferences, he said, you know, they were looking at areas to address and something that he, 
he mentioned specifically was, you know, interior with big men. Um, right. that they were, you know, interested in potentially bringing in someone else, um, you know, to compliment Shangun, which I thought was interesting. I would have, you know, just obviously I'm not a Rockets fan, but just what I've seen um, of the team, I would love to just continue to let him develop and let him continue to grow as a player. Cause um, mm-hmm. I think he's probably underrated in the, you know, the basketball community as a whole is just how skilled he is offensively, even at such a young age um, and how well their offense really looked when he kind of became the primary focal point of it. But, um, you know, they're going to, I think, take a really, really good sized leap, like not saying they're going to automatically become like contenders overnight or anything, or, you know, really be a force to reckon with, but um, (laughs) going from a team this year that looked like, you know, it looked like watching them sometimes look like AAU, Right, like they they're gonna <laughs> look so much more organized on both sides of the ball. Mm-hmm. Ime is definitely gonna get them bought in on defense. Like we saw what he was able to do with Boston last year. Um, I think this is also gonna do wonders for Tari Eason's development as a defender and a three and D guy in this league. Um, so I think that's a, a huge, huge hire for Houston. Yeah. Um, I feel like um especially going back to what you said about bringing more bigs in, I hope he just means like to compliment Sangoon. Like I just mm-hmm. hope he means like because the way he said it was he does a lot of things well, but we need some different type of bigs, I feel like. So hopefully yeah. he just brings in bigs that can like complement his skill set. But the main thing I got from this hire is the fact that they're taking basketball seriously. Like, yeah. they, <laughs> yeah. like they want to be a serious real basketball team. They don't want to just be a tanking. Like we're trying to get one Binyama and we're just gonna go out there and just do whatever. Like watching them play basketball last year looked terrible. Like they looked like they didn't have a coach and they just was doing whatever. So this this hire really showed me that they're actually serious about playing basketball. Like I said, they should hopefully bring in some veterans, improve, like get them bought into the defensive side of the ball. So uh, yeah, I agree. I really like this hire for them. Yeah, and, and two more uh coaching positions open up. Like I said, you know, Nick Nurse having been a you know, a uh, top candidate here for Houston. Um, he obviously got fired, um, you know, in Toronto this past season, which um, mm-hmm. looking at him and potentially, you know, Bud's firing, you know, coach is only a few years removed from winning a championship. Just goes to show you, you know, like it's a cutthroat business in the NBA, you know, you got to produce. So the coach of the um, year, didn't he win coach of the year too, as well? Who? Uh, Nick, Nick, Nurse? Nick Nurse? Didn't he, win a, didn't he win a coach of the year or am I wrong? Yeah, no, yeah, that's because that's the second time I saw people saying that. Uh, they fired coach of the year because uh, the Raptors did the same thing with Dwayne Casey. They <laughs> fired crazy. him the year he won yeah, coach of the year. Exactly. exactly. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so funnily enough, Dwayne Casey also, uh, they're not fired, but, but switches into a front office role there in Detroit. So that that position opens up. Um, and so when I look at both of these positions, right, like you have, to me, both really intriguing destinations if I was a you know a candidate there in terms of, Lots of young talent that you can kind of, you know, work to build around and develop, obviously, in Toronto with guys like Scotty. And then, you know, in Detroit with, with um, you know, Cade and Jalen Duran and Jaden Ivey. And they're going to have another high draft pick this year. And so there's a lot of promise in that Detroit organization. If they can get the right guy in there, uh, you know, that would be a, a huge, huge get for them in terms of, you know, really continuing to, to advance the development for some of their, their young players there. Um, you know, I'm looking at some of the people that, that have kind of been speculated for the position, a couple of different assistants around the league. Um, and I even saw for, I think the Raptors uh, head coaching position, they're going to hire, or they're looking to interview Becky Hammond, um, who used to be with the Spurs as an assistant, it kind of was rumored that she was going to take over potentially. Um, and she had interviewed for, I think, the Trailblazers job before they gave it to Chauncey, and then she hopped over to the WNBA and first season won a ring. <laughs> Um, hmm. So um, she's, I think, probably going to be pretty sought after there. Um, so, yeah, definitely, definitely two, two high value positions opened up um, and, and with potentially Boonhoser being on the way out as well. Um, some some big name teams um, with, you know, uh, definitely good opportunities for coaches to, to go in and make some instant impact for sure. Yeah, I, I it's, it's funny how um, even though the Pistons were ba- this bad this offseason, or this season, I should say, the the coaching spot, like the coaching job, does not it's not viewed as a bad one. It actually is viewed as a is a pretty interesting one, a pretty intriguing one. Like you said, with all the young players that they have there, the really high draft pick possibly could get one Minyama. Even if they don't get him, they still gonna have a chance at 
to a top tier like basketball player. So I'm not too knowledgeable on all of the coaching candidates. So I'm not going to speak on a lot of things that I don't know. I just hope that those organizations bring in people who are good with developing young players and know how to know how to turn these players into reaching their full potential, basically. So it's going to be real, real interesting. Like you said, the Budenholzer, the Budenholzer one is really interesting because, I mean, who do they could, like you said, they can get a Nick Nurse. Like, I don't know where they go from here, but it definitely, as long as it's not Budenholzer, like, <laughs> as long as it's not him, it's going to be real interesting to see what they do in that and what direction they go in. Yeah, I honestly give it probably to, like, Monday or Tuesday, he's gonna be going. I just I don't see a way where you can keep him after. Yes, he, he has to go. He has to go. There's no way he is. No way he's gonna remain the coach there. Yeah, yeah, it's a too too big of a collapse <laughs> to to I think to to stay in that that position. But the the Pistons one is definitely a real interesting one. I'm really I'm really curious to see what they do there because, like I said, like already have young talent on the roster. I for, honestly I forgot what's the name is there James, James, Wiseman. James Wiseman is yeah. there as well. But like they can get some. Can't forget really... about Killian either. Egg. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you get people in that can develop these players, and then with their top draft pick coming in, it's going to be really interesting. They got a really interesting future going forward. Yeah, I, I you know a lot of times when you have some of these lower lottery teams fire coaches like. It's almost an undesirable location, right? Like, exactly. You feel like the next guy that comes in is like it's like a setup, or like even when you look at you know, like in the NFL, right? Like the Texans before bringing in D'Amico Ryan's, like you bring in Lovey Smith, it's like he's not you, he's set up to fail. He's right, already this like your team you're has him up. nobody <laughs> on it, you know? Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. It's like these are completely different scenarios, really, for all these teams. Like, yes, they underperformed, and then like obviously the Pistons being super young, but like for like the Raptors. Um, and the Bucks, like obviously they underperform their expectations, but the talent is there, right? Like you're coming mm -hmm. in with, you know, more than enough to get it done. So um, definitely interested to see where these teams go um, in, in terms of coaching hires and, and moving forward. But yeah, man, playoffs just keeps getting crazier and crazier. I cannot, I cannot believe what I'm watching every night. Man, and it's and it's entertaining. It is, bro. I'm glued to my TV every single night. Even the games, like it's funny how like even the games that I'm not expecting to be good, like the Hawks Bucks, bro. We talked about it before the series. We're like, okay, Boston's gonna sweep the Hawks. Like, it's not really gonna be nothing entertaining. There's been some really good basketball in that series. There's been bro, some, I'm some... screaming at the TV. I'm looking at Trey Young come down the court. I'm expecting him to go for a little floater. I'm like, bro, they know he did not just put. <laughs> they made it. And like one it. step inside of the the logo, so yeah, so, nah, it's gonna be it's, it's only gonna get better. Second round intensity is gonna pick up. It's, man, it's only gonna get better. Yeah. Even though in the first round series, that's still going. These are some closeout games now, so you know you're gonna get the best basketball from both teams. Right, and at least now finally that we've reached this point, it's not gonna be two games on at the same times. So I know when it was, was right. War Warriors Kings Heat Bucks, I got. I got Warriors <laughs> Kings on the TV. I got Heat Bucks on the phone. I'm trying right, to just, multitask. Just looking like, right? <laughs> I'm on the yeah, phone with bad. somebody. He trying to like give me play by play on what's happening on one <laughs> game. It's like I can't hear both. So it's like, yeah. I almost, I almost missed. I almost missed the Heat game. The closeout. Now we're like the end of it. Yeah. Like I think honestly, I think you texted me. Or you texted like the Gucci or something, and then I switched over because it was it was getting late into the game. So yeah. I almost missed that one because I think the, the what the Warriors game was on at the same time. Yeah, and there's every both of them was tight. Everybody's going back and forth, but then it was like, nah, this Heat game is about to go into overtime. <laughs> yeah, nah, that's the one you need to lock into. <laughs> now I'm swapping them. Now Warriors is on my phone, Heat on the TV. So facts. <laughs> Glad that that phase is starting to pass, and hopefully we could you know, get each game on its own network and not have to, mm -hmm. to double up moving forward. But, right, yeah, man, excited. Going to this Nuggets suns game, I'm, bro, I'm soup, bro. <laughs> that's going to be, bro, being in there, that's going to be lit, bro. I'm, I'm excited to see the arena. Like, I've never gone to, to a playoff game before. Um, and I imagine, right, like, Denver's got to be – I feel like just watching them on TV, like, the crowd pops would be crazy. So, um I'm excited to just like be in the arena for the energy. And then at the same time, it's like, bro, I'm it's D book, it's KD, it's Chris. Bro, you're going Paul. to a good one. Like, bro, you're going to see some star. Like, you're going to see some stars, right? That's, yeah. a, that's a real good game, bro. That's going to be a real good yeah. game. Yeah. So, well, you, you say you want a game too? Game two, yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah, I think it's, it's Monday night. They haven't announced any times yet, but um, yeah, bro, I'm excited to go. I got some good seats. I'm like, 
15 ish rows off the court. Mm-hmm. So not not super, super close, but I close I, enough like, to see. Right. I was I was looking at ticket prices, you know, when I when I kind of announced them and I was looking, I was like, I'm not about to go and just sit, you know, in the nosebleeds. It's like, I'm not a Nuggets fan. Like, it's cool, but, right. like, I'm not just here to be a fan. Like, I'm here to enjoy the basketball, you know? And so, like, I saw the pricing for the tickets that were on the, you know, the first section. I was like, I bit the bullet. It's like, I got to go, got to <laughs> go. So, um, yeah, man, you got anything else you want, want to touch on here on the pod? Uh, honestly, no, nah, man. I feel like, bro, we talked about a lot. We talked about everything. It was, listen, it was, a, I don't know how long this episode is going to be, but it was a lot of stuff to talk yeah. about. So I'm just, I'm just excited moving forward. Like I said, hopefully my Lakers could close it out. Hopefully the Kings could come back because I'd rather play the Kings than the Warriors right now. But I mean, I honestly, as a basketball fan, I just, I'm excited to see good basketball moving forward. Real quick, we're about to go off the glass to the gridiron. What we think about the NFL draft? Ooh, yo, listen, Eagles. I don't, yo, bro. They, they be cheating, bro. The Eagles be cheating. How you, how you have the ninth pick, and end up with the best player in the draft, and then have the thirtieth pick and end up with like, like one of the best players in the draft that just fell somehow. Like, bro, it's crazy, bro. Howie Roseman, he sold his soul or something, bro. I don't know how he. I don't know, it, and he might trade for DeAndre Swift. Wait, what? But he, he, the Eagles said they might trade for John T. Swift because they because the Lions drafted Jameer Gibbs, so like they're getting, <laughs> they're getting like basically they're done with Swift, bro. Nah, bro. <laughs> nah, bro. I'm about to get signed, yeah, bro. Nah, what are you saying? So they drafted Jameer Gibbs at twelve, which was a t- bro. That pick is so dumb, bro. You don't draft a running back that high unless he's Bijan. But like yeah. you could have gotten him in the second round. They had another pick at eighteen. Like that was just dumb. But they drafted him at twelve. Whatever. They're getting rid of DeAndre Swift. So they're basically done with him. Eagles looking for trade for him. A bunch of other teams asking to trade for him. So that's going to be interesting, especially from a fantasy perspective. You know what I'm saying? I don't, you know, I'm always locked into fantasy football. But and no, I, it, it was Ray, a good draft. You cannot, you cannot allow Swift to get on the Eagles, bro. So they, they, could, they could have Jalen Carter, get Nolan Smith, and then get DeAndre Swift. Bro, being a, a Cowboys fan is – Torture sometimes, bro. Like it's not okay. You saw the Mike. You saw how Michael Parsons reacted. Michael Parsons, he was doing some little drafting. He was yeah. pissed, bro. He I'd have, bro, I'd have been too. Like, come on, it's not fair at this point. When you think about it, from like, cause the the Eagles had ten, the Bears had nine. Every mock, everyone said, "Oh yeah, like Jalen Carter's gonna fall in nine. Bears are gonna take him." But the Bears allowed them to trade back just to get an extra fourth. Like, is Jalen Carter really worth? I mean, like, is passing up on Jalen Carter worth an extra fourth round pick? Like, that doesn't make sense to me when I think about stuff like that. Like, it just doesn't make sense. But whatever. They got all them Georgia boys in Philly, bro. They're gonna get him right. They're gonna make sure he he good off all that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're gonna make sure he good off of you know some of that off the field stuff he had, bro. But yeah, bro. Yeah, being a Cowboys fan is rough because I'm watching this Eagles moves and I'm like, bro. What do we got, man? What do we got? What do we got? It's tough tough Uh, out here, man. It's tough out here. And what's good with Will Levis? He stinks, bro. He's not. Dang, it's like that. (laughs) But he's not good, bro. Like he's not a good quarterback, bro. At least, like I don't. I think uh, Anthony Richardson stinks too. But at least he's like the most athletic QB ever. So it's like if you if you're gonna take a risk on that, you might as well take a risk on a guy that could turn out to be the greatest quarterback ever. Like imagine if he really develops and is able to throw the ball. That compared with his legs, like he's gonna be insane. But yeah. well, Levis, he just he has a strong arm, but he just he's not accurate, and he's just I don't know. I I don't even watch college football like that, but I'm a vibe check type of guy, and I'm not getting. <laughs> you don't I'm pass not the getting, vibe check. I ain't not getting. You're not passing the vibe check, bro. I don't get good vibes from that. Bro, you QB bro. certified. I'm trusting your opinion on this, bro. <laughs> I I think Bryce Young is the best. CJ Shaw is gonna be a solid quarterback. I think Anthony Richardson is the most boomer bust quarterback I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and then Will Levis, he just I, I mean, at best case scenario, I think he's like a game manager. Like if he if he falls into the right system, maybe he could sit a year, then I think he could be solid. But I don't t- think he's a franchise guy. What you think about Stetson Bennett, bro? Two time champion, championship, <laughs> championship DNA, bro. Bro, he's gonna make a great third string for somebody, bro. He's gonna make, he's gonna be a great backup somewhere. Bro, isn't he like twenty six? Bro, he's mad old, bro. He's yeah, he's like yeah, he's like crazy. 25, 26, bro. He stayed, stayed like all four years. Yeah, he's, he's, not, gonna, he's yeah. not a he's not a solid like 
he's one of those like you know how like Alabama and Georgia normally just has like a game manager guy. Like if you're yeah. a game manager in college, bro, you're not gonna be in the NFL and be a franchise guy, bro. Yeah, I feel like he's gonna. Yeah. I feel like you have a career path similar to like where Colt McCoy is now, where it's like he's like a well respected backup yeah. could come, can come in and like patchwork you and win you some games just because like he's got the mm-hmm. IQ to do it. It's like he's never gonna be your your guy, you know. But I take if I'm bro, if I'm him though, because like yeah, like you say, he already has like the he's like a Georgia. I'm not gonna say Georgia legend, but like he's gonna no, be no. He he is. I guess bro, he is. Two I guess time he is. champ. He I probably don't got to pay for nothing in Athens ever again. That is true. So I mean, being a Georgia legend and then just being like a career backup, bro, I'd be a career backup. What getting paid to just chill? Everybody likes the backup. Right. You're not even gonna play, you're not gonna get hurt. You good, bro. That's a that's a great job. Yeah. Any other draft hot takes? I know the Steelers got the first pick in the next round. What are we looking at? I, I heard teams are trying to trade up for Levis with that pick. Oh yeah. I, I, if we can get some draft picks, that'd be cool. Who did y'all pick? Who did y'all pick yesterday? We picked a tackle, a Georgia a tackle. Listen, he's I don't watch college football, he's from Georgia, so you gotta be good. And that's all I know. He's a tackle <laughs> Look, from Georgia, so you gotta be good. It. I don't know what they feeding them over there, but <laughs> oh, they all huge, bro. They all huge. I'm going down. I'm going to Georgia soon for uh my brother official visits. Ooh, that's gonna be crazy. that's gonna be lit, bro. Yeah, bro. I know the facility's gotta be crazy. Oh yeah. yeah, I went to the only only like big time college like trip I've been on with him was Penn State, and their facilities was insane. So I know Georgia's like Georgia, Alabama, SEC is Oregon. a different level. Bro, like that joint is gonna be crazy, bro. I can't wait. That's gonna be valid. But other draft hot take, huh? Nah, it, everything kind of went as planned, other than the Jameer Gibbs one. The Jameer Gibbs one was the only one I was like, bro, what are they doing? Everything mm-hmm. else, I feel like people really got their need. Like they they got a position need for the most part. Nobody really had like a horrible draft. Yeah, the Texans went crazy too, and back to back two or three. That was wild. I wasn't expecting that. I'm wild, like, bro. I'm genuinely so out of the loop, like, with so many of these players. So I'm just like, <laughs> I'm going based off of y'all reactions in the group chat. But, like, I know who CJ Stroud and Will Anderson are. That's a crazy combo to put together. Yeah, to, to get, because it was like, people were like, yo, are they going to go? Are they, if, because they wanted Bryce Young bad. And once Bryce Young got picked, they were like, all right, are they going to go defense? Because they were just going to be like, all right, whatever. Let's just get the best defensive player. And then when Shroud, I was like, all right, cool, whatever. Then they traded up. I'm like, bro, so they got arguably the best defensive player in the draft and their quarterback. Like, that's crazy. At, they gave up a lot, draft, but that's crazy. Because yeah. they gave out – I think they gave up their first rounder for next year too. So, that, that – it low-key is a lot they gave up. But, I mean, if they both turn out to be, like, franchise guys, then it's valid. Yeah, definitely, definitely would pay off for them. Um, I think who else like did anything? I don't think nobody else really did anything crazy. And then it was that, yeah, four four receivers rattled off too. I saw that JSN, Quinn, and then Zay and Jordan back to back to back to back. For for real life football, I love that for the Seahawks. Like that's a great pick for them. For fantasy football, I wanted JSN to go to like the Chargers or something. I want him <laughs> to go somewhere where he's the guy, so I could take him to fantasy. But like real yeah. life football, that that was great. That was a good pick. <laughs> I saw somebody say, "Man, it's not it's not in the cards for the Giants to get a receiver because they had all all four of them got picked right before the Giants." <laughs> yeah, bro, that is crazy. They they needed one too. Oh, that's yeah, another, oh, I that. Uh, B, I remember Bijan went to the Falcons. Yeah, that was that was a like. Oh, it's, like, it's questionable because it's like you are taking a running back that high and you already have a thousand yard rusher on your team. Like, but it feels he's like better. They wasn't sold on Algier, though, right? Like, they was running Not him. Really. And then running back is such a weird position now. It's just like you had Cordero, and then it's like you started running Algier. And then they had a third guy kind of step in towards the, the end of the season and kind of yeah. get some extra carries, too. I forgot his name. I forgot what yeah. his name was. But I know who you're talking about. Yeah. It's tough. when you don't. I feel like when you don't got the draft capital, you're so replaceable at running back. Like, they yeah. obviously, they like, they're committed to Bijan. Like, they took an eight. But, like, Algier was like a fourth-round pick. Like when you go that late as a running back, you no one was really committed to you like that. Yeah, right. got to be committed now to to Bijan. I guess Lions got to be committed to Jameer Gibbs too. Yeah, at twelve. Oh yeah, definitely. And it's like they signed Monty. So it's like like 
Bro, I don't know. That pick was just Wait, so questionable to me. Who signed Monty? The Lions. They have David Montgomery. Are you serious? Yes, bro. Yo, I'm have... so not lying. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, bro. They had, they had, as of right now, they have DeAndre Swift, David Montgomery, and Jameer Gibbs all Bro, just put team. Swift in the slot. They good, bro. They could. They could have him the opposite slot of Amon Ra. Right. And well, they can just run. They're going to run him in a slot, and I'm going to still start him at running back and fantasy <laughs> get all the PPR points. Yeah. Out here trying to cheat, bro. That, that is, crazy. is crazy. Yeah, everything, everything else looks valid, though. Everything else. Is, they got Zay Flowers. Get my man Lamar another weapon. Jordan Addison aside of uh, Jay Jeff. I think I think he's going to be a real good receiver, especially now he's going to be a number two. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, that's crazy. Jordan Addison's nice. Yeah, no, I saw some of his highlights. He looked he looked, how tall is he? He looked kind of short. For all these receivers, besides I think J- JSN is like six two. Quinn Johnson's like six three. He's yeah. mad tall, but like Zay Flowers are like five nine. Jordan Addison's Damn. probably like five ten, five eleven, something like that. These receivers is not tall, bro. Dang. Yeah, that's crazy. I did not know Montgomery was on the line. Hey, bro, they got a little, little, little three-headed monster as of right now. I want to see where Will Love is going to go. Now I'm kind of curious. Wait, wait, wait. Why did the you know, the Colts owner just tweeted, Colts fans, would you take Will Levis at number two if you're on the board for the Colts four hours from now and go – Montana Young for franchise. I don't even know what this means. I was say, what is that? I say, what does that even mean? What are they talking about? The Colts owner said that. Yeah, Jim Irsay just tweeted that. Bro, what? I need to see. Hold on, who who has the picks after us? Is the Cardinals, the Lions, and then the Colts? He's oh. saying he like he literally just was tweeted to the Colts fans like. Yo, would y'all take Will Levis? Just because he... Are they going to get... Oh, they're not... Pro- Wait, no. Oh, They already they have Anthony it. Richardson, Oh, though. okay, 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 okay. All right, that makes sense. Oh, no. What? They don't... Wait, what? So they would... <laughs> they're going to take Anthony Richardson and Will Levis? That'd be crazy. Is this, like... Are, are they trying to say that this is something that happened with Joe Montana and Steve Young? Like, was they both on the scene at oh, the yeah. same time? Uh, yeah, he was his backup, I think. Steve Young was his backup. Is this dude nah bro? That's insane for an owner to tweet as soon as you like you literally just draft the franchise guy with the fourth pick. Yeah, that's insane. And you can yeah. draft another QB. Do you not care about any other position? Steve Young, yeah. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Oh, okay. So Steve Young was the backup for Joe Montana for a couple years. Wow. That's he's, crazy, bro. He's why is he tweeting that? For that? Yeah, why is he tweeting? I thought it was fake. Like I'm literally clicking on the account. Like oh, this is bogus. But no, bro. Five hundred thirteen thousand followers, and it has the this account. His account is affiliated with the Indianapolis Colts. Like, this is him, bro. If I'm anti rich I'm like, bro. What are you talking about? Why would you? That's such a waste. That's insane. <clears throat> Maybe he just like saying it just to say. Or he could just be saying that's what teams would try to trade up. So they'd be like, oh, would they really take him? Let's try to steal Will Levis from him. Like, I don't know, bro. You should uh, you should let the GM be the GM <laughs> and not, nah, not be talking about that right now. Thanks. That's a Ram, Seattle. Seattle could take him. Be a backup for Geno for a little bit. They Raiders didn't take a take QB, him. did they? No. Nah, they At that the, point, uh, that would be a know. steal for Seattle. Right. They could get the, the Geno replacement. Mm-hmm. They could develop for a year or two. Sit behind. Yeah. He's he going to go in the second round. He's going to go early second round. Yeah. Ah, right, bro. I'm literally looking at the full <laughs> draft list. It's like, bro, outside of, like, the quarterbacks here and Jalen Carter and Bijan, I could not tell you nothing about none of these players. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of these dudes. I heard Witherspoon in the corner is nice. Chris Johnson's supposed to be a solid tackle. Tyree Wilson's supposed to be like an athletic freak. I don't know nothing about Darnell Rice. I don't know nothing about a lot of these tackles. And 
Yeah. I heard uh, Patriots, they got Christian Gonzalez. I heard he's nice. I did hear that he was good. Because I uh, saw – it was a Jets fan I saw that was tight that they didn't take them. They took uh, Will McDonald. Are you talking about, bro? The... <laughs> yeah. Pick a side yeah. here, Joel. <laughs> yeah. I'm dead. I've seen that shit. That video is hilarious. <laughs> hey, clowning him. Yo, bro, how tall is bro? I'm sorry, bro. Like that, it did look crazy. I think other dudes just mad tall as well. Like he's short. Oh, he's short. I think he yeah, did. Other dude is mad tall though. So it made, bro. Listen, as a short guy myself, you can't stand by mad tall people all the time, bro. Especially in videos, you look crazy. You gotta, you gotta you know about that, that. the optics. Yeah, and bro, you gotta listen. If you're in a group of three and it's like a short guy, like average height, tall guy, you gotta like go like in a line. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. Uh. Well, damn, that's a nice little little after show rundown on the draft. Thanks. And we could we could pivot a little bit. We get to NFL season, have some some more off the glass to the gridiron. I like that. Yeah. You know, I'm cool with that. For sure. But as always, we appreciate you for tuning in to another episode of the Off the Glass Podcast. As always, please like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Um and get ready, man. The second round is coming fast and furious. Yes, sir. It's about to get crazy. About to get real mm-hmm. crazy. Sure, but continue to show support to the channel. Share it with your family, your friends. We appreciate it as always. And we out. Peace. Yes, sir.